you know, we were talking before we went on air about, uh, about the transition. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. you know, you talk about how, you know, I always thought there was a correlation between veterans and, and, uh, athletes. hundred percent. You know, not even because somebody told me a long time ago that the adrenaline is up and down, up yep. and down. Right. Yep. So it's the same way in football, yeah. up and down, up yep. and down. And you're just trying to stay level the whole way through. Yep. So then when it's gone, it's like, whoa. Yeah, 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 yeah. What do I do now? Uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, like, so let's talk about how your transition has been. Yeah. You know, let's start at the beginning, though, because uh, I listened to you on the Drinking Bros, man, and, like, yeah. your, your, your whole story <laughs> is just incredible. Yes, sir. Thank so you. let's just start at the beginning. Like, yeah. Give her, tell everybody your name. Yeah. Where you come from. Yeah. Where you grew up. And then let's just roll. Yeah, and if I, if, if you want me to elaborate more because I'm jumping through stuff, just let me know. And I'll yeah, I'll stop now. you. But, I'll stop uh, you. Yeah, I was uh, born in Nigeria. Uh, my dad was uh, Chief John Adebayo Adeleke, um, very successful entrepreneur, visionary, engineer. And uh, so when I was born, I was born into wealth. You know, my dad, he engineered one of the first man-made islands in the world. Um, exists to this day is now known as Banana Island, but originally my dad uh, the name named it Lagoon City. And so, to make a long story short, in 1987, uh, the the Lagos State Government came in and essentially took it from him. And my dad went to the court, went through the court systems, which is corrupt in and of itself. I mean, a lot of <laughs> oh, Nigerians and put from the politics to judicial system, everything is just. Overtly corrupt. I mean, it's corruption like every government, but it's very overtly corrupt in Nigeria. And so went to go find him, died weeks later, um, mysteriously. And then we went from rich. Well, hold on, hold on. Back up. Yeah. He died mysteriously. Yeah. So my dad was getting, while he was developing the island, he was getting uh, like passive threats um, from people just the same. Because essentially he had bought a massive plot of land years earlier called Marico. And his goal was to essentially turn Marico into like a Wall Street because Nigeria is super rich in resources, mm -hmm. oil, natural gas, cocoa, you name it, Nigeria has it. And so he wanted to create a place where all of these all of these natural resources and the funds from these natural resources can be organized and people from all around the world could come and do business. And there was a military coup. Long story short, the, 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 the government, the military government took that from him. And then he, you know, after democracy was reinstalled, then he went through the court system and to, to, to fight for compensation because they weren't mm -hmm. going to give him back Marico. And so essentially what they gave him was what he kind of settled on was the swamp, was the lagoon. And his idea, was like, like I said, was to dredge the foreshore to create an island. Now, when he started doing that, like for, before he even started that, like there were people who were just like, dude, what are you going to do with a body of water? Like. You're an idiot. Like, why do you want this? Yeah. And then once people started seeing the land form, and they started seeing, holy crap! Like this dude was, <laughs> this dude was thinking way ahead of all of us. Way ahead. Then it started to turn yeah. into passive threats. Like, so oh, what, how would they threaten him? In what ways? Because this is like yeah. this is in the eighties, right? Yeah. So this is this before 80s. social media yeah. and yeah. text messaging and stuff like that. So letters, letters. And letters Verbally, he would go to meetings or he would go to p parties and people would come by and, you know, just say, hey, you know that uh, somebody's going to come take this from you at some point. And again, I'm just paraphrasing, but it was, you know, verbally, uh, letters, just in different ways. Like, and there was other crazy stuff I won't go into that happened to me and my mom and my, and my brother while we were out there um, that was like clear that people did not want us. And they were watching you and yeah. following you. and Yep. And my dad was super powerful. He was like well connected. He was connected to governors, uh, the Oluolu. The Oluolu is like considered the king of the Yorubas because we're Yoruba. So he he knew everybody, generals. He knew all of these different people, and uh, and so it started out with those passive threats as he was formulating this uh, the island. And then once it formed, then it was like, oh, we're gonna take this from you now. Yeah. And then once he started fighting, then the threats then progressed to. You don't want to. You don't want. You don't want to fight this fight. And you what know, was the reason for them not wanting him to? What I don't understand. Greed, greed, corruption. You know, in Nigeria, um, when people want to get rich, like parents, they motive, they essentially instill in their kids the importance of getting into politics. 
So like when in inner cities, it's like, yo, play basketball or rap or, you know, sell drugs. Like that's the thing, you know, coming from the inner city. That's kind of, yeah. I know that's like the, the pattern, right? In Nigeria, you'll have politicians who will go into uh, uh, politics, whether governor, senator, or even a ministry of, of finance or oil or whatever. They'll go in poor or they go in like not wealthy at all and they'll come out billionaires not millionaires i mean same thing happens here yeah same thing happens here but there it's it's, it's like on a whole yeah. another scale like and and once they finish their time in office it's tradition for them to leave nigeria and go to the uk go come to the us mm. for example the oil the uh, ministry of oil um i think this was it's like 2011 maybe 2010 um she got caught sell, selling like shipments of oil like at like no, like, like, if again, I'm, I can't remember the exact number, but if like a ship of oil was worth like a hundred billion dollars, again, I'm just throwing out a r random number just to make this point, then she would sell it for like five billion, pocket the five billion, mm -hmm. the ship would disappear. After she left office, it was discovered what she was doing. She fled to London beforehand because she knew it was going to happen in London, a billionaire. And then the Nigerian government was like, yo, you need to come back and face these charges. And she claimed that, you know, she had cancer and she had to stay in London to continue her cancer treatment. So I say all that to say, like, corruption is so systemic. Like, yeah. again, we have it here. Like, you have politicians. I, you have politicians who will go into politics with a pure heart, I believe. Like, they want to lead the people. They want to make good decisions. But then they start seeing, oh, somebody tell, hey, you know, you could – you could do some insider trading here. You know, you could, you know, cut a deal here, and you know, you yeah. and it's not bad. It's not. It's not, it's not a big deal, but in reality, it is. Yeah, it, it's a I mean? it's a trickle down effect, right? Yeah. Because you got these politicians in America. The the amount of money that's spent on campaigns. Yes, millions. They have to they they have to get that money from somewhere, yep. right? Yeah. So those come from special interests. Yep. So these lobbyists go out and they yep. lobby and raise money for them, cut deals, and yeah. in turn, they're going to get favor when it comes to bill passing exactly and, um you know local government even at the local government you know small local yep. governments like just to get like permits through yep. right like they will they will raise money for somebody there's nothing for them to donate a million bucks because exactly. they have a 200 million dollar project that's going exactly you know exactly and they need the the building permits moved you know because for i'm doing i'm building a house right now and it's yeah. taking me like eight months to get the permits yep. all the way done. And yep. it's like, but if you know the right person, if I know the right people, cut, hey, I'll donate X, Y, Z. The right check. You'll, you know they'll I mean? have that in three days, two yeah. days. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? They'll move that to the right to the top of the pile. Exactly. You know, exactly. So it's, it's like the same kind of thing, but yeah. So, so what age did you, did you leave Nigeria? So, so how, so your, so your dad was, my dad was, uh, so this was 1987. I was five. Threats started coming in. Long story short, my dad ended up getting, um, you know, he was going for uh, a, a walk because he was super stressed out of everything, you know, about everything that was happening. And hold on, not, not to interrupt you, but these yeah. are like, at that age, those are when your first like memories are yeah, developed. Like yeah. Your first, yeah. Your first memories are yeah. of that. Is Africa. <laughs> yeah, it, it was all Africa. You know, there's little things like I remember the boarding, not the boarding school, but the private school that we went to on Lagos Island, you know, and I remember getting into a fight, you know, one of my first fights. Like, that's like one of my first memories, you know, is the first fight that I got into. And my mm -hmm. mom and dad came to the school and my mom was really upset because my mom's American. My dad, you know, she, my mom and dad met in America and then my my dad brought my mom back to Nigeria. My dad was just like champion me. He's like, yeah, that's my son. Get out of yeah. here, right? And my mom's like, you can't encourage him, right? <laughs> and so those are some of my first memories. So, you know, when uh, long story short, he ended up going for a walk because he was he was super stressed out about the case and uh, the neighbor's dog. You know, um, never happened. He was friendly with the do dog. Was friendly towards my dad and neighbor's dog bit my dad. And so uh, my dad went to the hospital just you know to get medication you know didn't want to make sure he didn't get rabies and get a little uh, tetanus shot that's all he probably needed is some stitches oh it, well nigeria is different brother because <laughs> them dogs out there ain't like out here. Uh, <laughs> and uh all kinds of bacteria oh there. yeah oh yeah oh yeah and so um essentially he uh flew to germany and he flew from germany to new york and then after he flew from New York back to Nigeria, like he had the medication, he didn't take it. He finally took the medication when he got back to Nigeria. And when he took the medication, um, essentially that's what ultimately on the autopsy, they found that that's what ultimately killed him. Like it was something in the medication that killed him. And what was the cause of death? A uh, heart, his heart freaking, like the, 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 our maid, 
set the bath. She was the last person to see him alive. She set the bath. He uh, took the medication, went in to go take a bath, and never came out. And died in a bathtub. And then right after that, like, everything, there was no one left to fight. You know, my dad, you know. And, and there's a lot of people who are in his, cur- who are in his circle who, who played a role in all of this, and it got cuts. For example, I, our family security guard is to this day, he's a manager of Banana Island. Like he's one of the managers of Banana Island. There's generals, I won't mention their names, uh, and other politicians who were my dad's friends. And they have massive properties on Banana Island. It's the ones and closest stewards to you. Exactly. It's always the ones closest to you. Exactly. And so, um, so that's why we, like, when, when a story is all pieced together, it's clear what happened. You know, they didn't ex- expect him to do what he did. He pretty much turned water into wine by creating an island where they was no land where there wasn't anything people were like hey i want a piece of that because they saw how lucrative it was he was like nope i did all of the work you guys called me fools and said it would never happen they were like all right if you're not going to give it to us then we're going to take other we're going to go a different route they took it then he went to court fought them they got tired of him babbling and, and running his mouth and, and fighting and they knew that he would never give in and then he turns up dead weeks later yeah you know what I mean? All, yeah. all within a, a short time period. It doesn't seem like a coincidence. And then all of the people within his circle and people outside his circle now, to this day, have stakes in Banana Island. They were all rewarded. Yeah, yeah. They, they all profited off of his death. Yep. And here's a crazy thing. Like, I did a post on July 4th. Um, um, not just, like, you know, not any, not anything against Nigeria, just, like, something. Hey, just say, hey, I'm proud to be an American. Like, Independence Day. And I kind of bullet pointed out my my story. I didn't think anything of it. I posted to Twitter, posted to Instagram. Dude, it went viral on Twitter, dude. I had like, I had hundreds of thousands of night, like no exaggeration, Nigerians. See, as a matter of fact, I think it, it hit like in like four or five days. It hit like four million, Ooh. four million, four million views. Oh yeah, that's viral. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I had so many Nigerians reach out to me, like, dude, we didn't know that. You were Chief John's son, John Adebayo Adelake's son, because I was in a movie called Plane, and that movie yeah. did well in Nigeria. There were a lot of Nigerians that saw it, and when they when they saw the credits, they saw my name, Remy Adelake. It was like, oh, he's a Yoruba, but they didn't put two and two together and realize, you know, to, to realize that I'm that dude's son. And so when they I saw the post, and they was like, you're Chief John Adebayo's Adelake's son. It's like we it's crazy to hear that. And then it was the other reoccurring theme was there were people who were saying. The current president of Nigeria lied to us, and we knew that he was lying, but he lied to us. He told us that he's the one that created Banana Island. Oh, so he's... And he was the senator, or he was either the senator or governor of Lagos Mm. in 1987. So he was part of that game, too. In 1987, to this day, now he's the president, and he... I didn't didn't even know that until, like, when I say, like, literally, like... 100 messages on Instagram, on Twitter saying, and Instagram of Nigerians saying the president lied. We knew he was lying. We knew that he didn't discover it. We knew that it was Chief John Adebayo, but this is now even more proof that he was lying to us because, you know. So you're still just learning so much about what had happened. Yeah. And what went down and how it went down and reasons for why it went down. 100%. Like to this day, like (sighs) more stuff unravels, more stuff unravels. That's that's some deep stuff because, like, I mean, I'm sure you got trauma instilled in there. Like, from that age, from that age, seeing your dad probably stressed out. Yeah, yeah. That way, that like your kids aren't supposed to see you stressed out. You know what I well, mean? Well, he did. So. A, he did a good job. Him and my mom did a good job of like keeping, like hiding their emotions. Yeah. Like when I'm when I think of my dad and when I remember my dad, I always remember him smiling. You know what I mean? Oh, Regardless so of the situation. Like, I always remember him, like, everything mood. is going to be okay. Yeah. Even when, and then when I'm talking to, my, now when I talk to my mom, or even when I was writing my memoir, you know, to get information from my mom, my mom was, like, filling me in of all of the turmoil, all the stuff that was going on behind the scenes. As a matter of fact, I flew to Nigeria in, in 2018 because I wanted to get there and, and, and write, the last, write the last chapter of my book in Nigeria so that I can get the sense of the people and, 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 and you know, just the environment. And, um... I uh, I had a long meeting interview with I have it on YouTube to this day with my dad's mentee. Uh, What's your OB. YouTube channel? It's just Remy Adelaide. It's not it's not it's nothing big. It's nothing like you know it's, it's not a big podcast or anything like that. It's just I just dro- drop videos on there. I don't think I only got like seven eight thousand subscribers on there. But uh, but yeah, I interviewed my dad's mentee Obi, and he's like 
really big in Nigeria, and he told me all kinds of stuff that was happening. Wow. And like he even told me about another project that my dad had done that the Nigerian government had taken from him. And but the biggest thing that he told me was he said was I always remember your dad smiling and I always remember your dad's laugh even in the midst of all of the stuff he was going through. He always hit it. He didn't he didn't you know show it to me. He didn't show it to you and your mom and dad. He was just always cool and suave. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's that's what I remember. You know. Well, that's, that that means you got good memories. You know yeah. what I mean. So you get the you get so maybe there isn't trauma in there. Maybe you yeah. got those happy memories with your father. Oh, so yeah. so what age did you did your mom bring you guys to to America? Uh, uh, I was five, so eighty seven. Eighty seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You went straight to the Bronx. The yeah. Bronx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Straight to the gutter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we, my dad, in the '60s, because my dad was on the board of the World Trade Center in New York City. I mean, that dude, like I said, he did a lot. He was on the British Financial Planning Council in Great Britain, and uh, so in the '60s. He bought a, a, a co-op apartment in the Bronx because you got to remember the Bronx wasn't always the Bronx. No, like you know, in the forties, fifties, sixties, it was like predominantly white neighborhood, Irish, mm-hmm. Italian. Like you know, it was d- way different. And then um, uh, it was the and, mo- it was the, the mob ran that. Yeah, yeah, the mob, well, well the, yeah, the mob, yeah, yeah, the mob was definitely in. I mean, the mob was big even when I was in. Oh, in yeah. the, I remember going into the uh, bodegas and seeing the Italian mafia dudes, big hair, yeah. big collars, going in and collecting tax from the local Dominican uh, store owners. It's funny. There's a, a connection there. So you know who Sammy the Bull is? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, so yeah, I got, yeah. I've been talking to Sammy. He's gonna oh, come yeah. do a podcast. With oh me. yeah, he's from the Bronx, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In there, in there. Yeah, he was, wasn't he a hitman? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he was a hitman. <laughs> I'm yeah. just like, talk about some, it's going to be really interesting. Yeah, it's going to be crazy, man. You know, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of things he ain't going to want to talk about. Yeah, statues. Well, he told bit. me, he said, we could talk about, he said, no, yeah. this, he said, I'm good on everything to oh, talk about it? whatever. And I yeah. said, you're serious? And he's like, yeah. I was like, all right. That's crazy. So I was just like, I'm going to do so much research. Yeah. That, so I have some great questions to ask him. Well, maybe. ask him about, ask him when you do talk to him, ask him about Jimmy from Jimmy's Cafe. Okay. So there was a so there was a guy who lived in my building. His name was Jimmy, and he owned a place like literally right down the street from from uh, where I grew up called Jimmy's Cafe. And it was like I don't know if you ever saw Goodfellas, mm-hmm. um, but there's a scene when they go into that you know, that one shot scene where they walk through the. Uh, uh, restaurant, the little and deli, back in, and and then you know it's, it's, it's like a restaurant. He, oh, this oh, where he takes oh, his yeah. wife on a date for the first time, yep, yep. and then like, it, but it's the place where all the mobsters hang out and they bring their girlfriends and stuff like that. Well, Jimmy's was kind of like that. It was like a big plot spot. Like when you would walk by, it would be these long lines of people trying to get into Jimmy's cafe. But mob dudes would hang out there sometimes too. Anyway, Jimmy disappeared. Mm. Like when I was like this in maybe ninety six, ninety seven. And he lived in my building, and he always had like pss, nice cars, jewelry, all of this stuff. Nobody ever found him, mm. so I'm so I'm curious to uh, just I'm curious if Sammy even knows. Oh, you know, sure he doesn't say what happened, but if he knows who Jimmy, well, he was Jimmy like was. second in command. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so he probably definitely knows yeah. what happened. Because when he get pinched, he got pinched in like what the 80s and 90s. No, he got pinched late 90s, late early 90s. 2000. It yeah. was the John, it was it was John Gotti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they took down um, um, sorry, what was the family? Uh, the uh, Gambino uh, Gambino family, yeah, 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 yeah. and him, they did it in broad daylight, remember? Yeah, 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 he was with John Gotti when they did that, got it, got so it. So, I guess what happened was when they all got pinched, he ended up doing 19, 20 years, yeah, yeah, yeah. but um, that's better than doing light. Oh, he yeah, he figured yeah. I'll turn, he said, they got these guys hooked already, I yeah. might as well go ahead and take my 19 yeah. years and be able to get out, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm interested to hear that whole story, you yeah. Know, yeah. So. So what was it like? What was the, was it a culture shock for you? No, no, because, you know, I tell people all the time that my mom, she did a real, like I, like I was mentioning earlier with my dad and how he always kind of presented like everything was okay, you know, for me and my brother and my, my mom, you know, my, that's the way my mom was. You know, my mom always presented like everything was okay. So even in the apartment that we grew up in, um, as I was mentioning earlier, my dad bought that apartment in the 60s. And, That's just and an investment property? Just because he did, would fly to New York all the time to do business. And he didn't like hotels. And so he would he bought that apartment. It was it was night, it was like a completely different area, you know, in the sixties. And then as time went on, then it changed and the crack seventies yeah. hit, crack <laughs> epidemic, then everything changed like outside of the co-op, but even inside the co-op as well. And so um in our apartment, my dad had art, you know, books. 
all of that stuff in there. And so my mom added to what she brought from Nigeria. She added to that. And then she kept our apartment super clean and, you know, well manicured and, you know, with the little pen she had. So I say all that to say that was our world. And when, 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 when you're young, like, you know, five, six, my brother was six, you like, everything is big to you. Like, in front oh, yeah. of your door, like my kids, like everything is like big to, to oh, me, yeah. you know what I mean? And so that was still big to me. It was still like, oh, this is like big to me. As long as I got my toys, I got my brother, you know, I got food, like everything's all perspective. All good. You yeah. only know what you know, right? Exactly. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So, yeah. And so, you know, um, my mom just, she maintained that. She she worked like three jobs, you know, in order to provide for my brother and I. Um, there were times when she didn't have enough food to feed herself. She would just have enough food to like feed my brother and I. And my brother told me this story years later because I didn't, you know, being so young, you don't realize it. Cause I would always wonder why is my mom, why does she put food on the table and then like stand in the doorway and watch us like in the kitchen, oh, in the kitchen doorway and watch us. And then it wasn't until I was like, until a few years later that my brother was like, it's cause she's not eating. Yeah. You know, she's just giving us the food, you know? So Man, I'm so, I'm so envious of that because, yeah. you know, I didn't have that as a, as a kid. Yeah, my yeah. mom could give a shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was totally opposite for me. Like yeah. my mom didn't care if I ate or if I had a place to sleep. It, oh, it wow. just wasn't important to her. Wow. She was worried about herself and herself only. Wow. So to hear that, man, that's like, that's awesome. To what, me. what do you, what do you think caused that? Like what was like, was, did she have alcohol, past trauma? Okay. Alcohol, got it. Got it. Drugs, got it. And she just, she was abused as a child too. Mm. She just like, was hurt not, people, she hurt was people. not, so, you know, some people aren't meant to be a parent to, to be a parent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And she just wasn't meant to be a parent. You know, it just wasn't, it wasn't for her, and uh, she doesn't know who my dad even is. Oh wow, wow! Um, then my stepdad was really abusive as well. So I was just in this crazy abusive household that, you know, it was like a dog eat dog. You know, you he abused out. her, and oh, yeah. oh, he would beat her up. He oh, wow. beat me up. She'd beat him up. It was wow. She'd beat me. Everybody and you guys had siblings, up. or was it just? You I had a half brother and a half sister. Mm. They got treated totally different from me. Mm. Um, they were they weren't like they were so young when that was going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I my sister saw it. Like my my uh my half sister, she would see Yeah. Like I'd just be laying there kind of bloodied up, you know, beat up. And, yeah. You know, she'd come over and like try to console me. But it was like it just a very very like total opposite of mm -hmm. that, where you talk about how your mom was yeah, like yeah. really looking out for you and really making sure that you guys didn't see the struggle. Yeah. And try to give you the most, the best opportunity she possibly could. 100%. Because, she, like, that's a lot of women could just say, you know what, man, we, like, we, they could, she could have gave up, especially yeah. in that period. There was yeah. a lot of people that just gave up and yeah. just decided to turn to crack. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people. Yeah. Or, or, you know, like my mom, I, I, I've told my mom, I've asked my mom multiple times, why you never got mar married? Why didn't you ever remarry? Because my mom's a beautiful woman. Even now, my mom's 71. People think she's like, 45, 50, because she works out. She does pull-ups, push-ups, runs, does all of this crazy stuff. And she always says, like, because my, my focus were you and your brother. Mm. I didn't want to bring any confusion into the house and then have you wondering what's going on. And I don't want to bring somebody toxic in the house that could, you know, screw up your mind in any way. And uh, so there was a lot of sacrifice yeah. for you. But I will say that, you know, when you were talking, one thing that came to mind, which I think is a connection in both of our stories, is you would probably want to have made it to the NFL if you didn't have that hard upbringing. I wouldn't have. You know what I mean? Like, if you I, were, I probably yeah. wouldn't have. Because how many big guys do yeah. you see that just don't? Yeah. They don't have it. Yeah. And I, it's like that dog. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I had that hunger and that dog. Exactly. And, um, you know, I was like, I made it through that. I could you could take the abuse. abuse. I could take the abuse. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Physical, yeah. mental, yeah. emotional. Like, that's football is mentally, yeah. physically... I mean, it it is everything that you're looking for when you come from a childhood like that. You know, Deion Sanders says it. Yeah, yeah. I want my quarterbacks to come from a really yeah rough, rough upbringing. No, they want their he wants his quarterbacks. To oh, come, come, come from, from the, like that you know, prestigious area. Three point five GPA. Yeah, 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 yeah. Both parents. Yeah, 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 yeah. He said, "My defensive lineman. I want them to be dogs. I want them to come from <laughs> broken homes. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah, like that. And it's it's true. That's man, true, man. Yeah, because it, it is a physic the physicality that's yeah. involved, and it's not just like oh, I just got to be physical on game day. Yeah, but you have Practice. to be yeah. physical every day because yeah, yeah, every yeah. day you're fighting for your job. Yeah, yeah exactly. At every level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And from high school on. Yeah. Like once you get to high school, somebody's trying to take your job. Yeah. And then you get to college, somebody's trying to take your job. Yeah. And you get to the NFL, and it's like every year there's a draft. Yeah. Yep, and there's yep. thousands of kids New, going to the combine. Yeah. And thousands. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of kids yep. ready, like, are just dying to take your job. Yeah. So it's like you have to just stay on top of that, and it, like, there's a lot of. 
like if you're not like if you're not built for it, yeah, yeah, yeah. it'll drain you and it crush you. you yeah, know I and mean? I was able to do it for ten years. Yeah, you know? and, and I got that, to win a Super Bowl. Yeah, you know, there's the ring. You can grab that ring. If yeah, you want. Oh, I saw it earlier. I was like, yeah. nah, I ain't gonna yeah, touch this ring. Yeah, I don't even think that's gonna fit on my finger. Yeah, it's bro. a size eighteen. <laughs> That's what's up, man. Big congrats, bro. Thank you, bro. It's, uh, you know, that's like when I started playing football at seven years old, um, you remember Reggie White? Yep, yep. So I saw, I was a Green Bay Packers fan growing up in Youngstown, Ohio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, I saw Reggie White carrying the trophy, the, the Lombardi trophy yeah, around, yeah. and I was like, man. You gonna get that I was one like, day. I want to do that. And he had like, he had his pads on still, and he took the Super Bowl t shirt and put it over his pads. Bro, I got to do it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, like, how many people get to do that? Not many. I mean, how many people, yeah. like, see something as a seven-year-old yep. and say, that's what I want to do, right? Like, even there's guys, you, I don't care what it is. I don't care if you see people flying into, you see Elon Musk yeah. sending space shuttles up, and you're like, man, one day I want to be on one of yeah. those. Yeah, Bro, chase that dream. Yeah, because yeah. Because it's all attainable, bro. It 100%. does not matter where you start. It's you, all up here. It's all in your head, it's man. It's all, I mean, because because like, like you mentioned, every single guy that shows up to the NFL – Almost like with SEAL training. Every single guy that shows up to SEAL training in the NFL, physically they have what it takes to be the best. Yeah, but do they have to get that chip? It's all about now at this point, like what's up here? Mm -hmm. How far are they willing to push? How far are they willing to go? You know what I mean? Like Tom and you know, Michael Jordan, we think of those great players. It's like physically, there were a lot of guys, and there are a lot of guys who are on that same level physically. But the question is how much of that dog it's the is mental. In them that's gonna push. Cause yeah, you know, I think about that sometimes when I think about I love and I love football by the way, dude. Like like my wife hates son. She hates football season, dude. <laughs> she hates football season because she knows that that's what I, I say. Because there's so many lessons learned, like life lessons and takeaways from watching a game. Just one game is like yeah. a whole life cycle. One hundred percent. And <laughs> my crazy. kids, like I point certain things out to my kids. I'm like, look, this dude's not even giving hundred percent. Look, these guys are already giving yeah, up. You like, see him loafing. Yeah. You see him not running to the ball. You see that. Yep. Like that's not how you. That's not how you do it. Yeah. And you got to You got to be all. I mean, just think of the percentage. And this is something I think about. Like guys who never win a chip. Oh, bro! I play with Champ Bailey. He played for sixteen years. Never yeah. Won one. Yeah, you know I mean, and then Demarcus Ware, who just got inducted yeah. in the Hall of Fame, one of the best teammates I ever had, bro. He was going on year ten or whatever when we won it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like, bro, I don't know. <laughs> he's like, I'm trying to win a Super Bowl. Like, yeah, yeah, I need yeah. a Super Bowl. What's that like? Well, I'm curious to know what's that like for guys that are like towards the end of their career and they haven't won it one yet, and like, what is their fight like? Oh, is they're it, pushing, yeah, pushing yeah. so hard. I was in Baltimore with a guy named Calais Campbell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You probably know who Calais is, but he, he, he was, he's just a, dude. This guy's like six eight, six nine. Yeah, like three hundred pounds. And he's just a dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he comes from he's from Colorado, and he come he was like comes from a bunch of brothers. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, you know, mama worked hard, daddy worked hard, but like they just come from kind of poverty. Yeah. And when you got all those kids, it's hard to keep them off. Oh, yeah, anyways, yeah. you know. But he just is like he wants a Super Bowl, so he's still playing. Like to this and day, he's in like year sixteen. And he's he has still got one, going, yeah. bro. And he still is just trying to get one. And I thought we were going to be able to get one in Baltimore. Yeah. But COVID happened. Yeah. And yeah. Ruined yeah. Everything for yeah. Us. yeah. But those guys, man, like they are driven. Like even so, Peyton, he Peyton Manning, he yeah. was so driven because his brother had already had two rings. Yeah, 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 and he yeah. only had one. So yeah, he, yeah. and we went to one and lost yeah, in New yeah. York. To, yeah, yeah. To, to the Seahawks. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, I got to get back. Yeah. So he was pushing so hard, man. His body was so beat up. Peyton's was like he had his bad neck, bad neck. Like he could have. Doctors told him if you get hit wrong, you might never walk again. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. I remember and he that. He just yeah. kept going. Didn't he have a surgery before? Oh yeah, that? he had a bad yeah, surgery. Yeah, yeah, and the, yeah. and the Colts cut him. Yeah, and then we picked him up. Yeah, and that was the year I got. I drafted. remember his first year here was the year I got drafted because he won the chip that year. Was it? Or was it the next year after he after? So the first year here, we lost to Baltimore, and Baltimore went and won it. We should have beat him. Did but, he, then, but I thought I thought Peyton won. Didn't he? He, he did. Won. It was in his last season. But was it the? But was, so was it the second year? The second year we went and lost. So it was the third year Denver then. Third year we went into the playoffs and lost to the Colts. So he was at Denver that long? Yeah, he was I didn't remember it being was, that long. I was teammates with him for four years. Okay, got it. So now we're back on record. <laughs> <laughs> so I always wanted to um, – I always was fascinated with military. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinated. As a kid, I was fascinated by soldiers and – you know, it's because like my, you know, my my stepdad and mom, they're '80s babies. Like yeah. they, they graduated high school in '88. Okay. You know what I mean? So yeah. like, Ram, all those '80s movies, I was watching yeah. those as a kid, like yeah. Rambo and yeah. all the Schwarzenegger movies, yeah. and like just all those movies. I was like, Predator. Man. Yeah, Predator and stuff. Like I was like, man, and I loved to hunt. You know, yeah. I started hunting at a young age, but it was like, I always thought it would be 
like a, it was my backup plan. Mm-hmm. You know I mean, it was like, if I don't make it in this football game, like I am 1000%. Yeah. Like, and I don't want to just be like, you know, so uh, a soldier. Just we want to go soldier. Yeah. I want to be like a special, special forces. Yeah, special, yeah. Like I want to be opera. Like yeah. I want to be an operator. Yeah, like, yeah. I want to be like a mercenary, you know, yeah, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, you know, I always yeah. thought that would be so cool. Yeah. Um, so that's why I think I'm so fascinated into like having conversations with you guys because you guys did something that I was so interested in yeah. growing up. And that was like, I hated school. Yeah, like, yeah, I just yeah. hated it. You yeah. know, I didn't, I, it's not that I hated like learning anything. It was that it was just, wasn't yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Like it wasn't interesting. I was like, how yeah. am I, I, I'm not like, I can't apply this into my every day, you know? It's so interesting. I was listening to uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino um, last night and he was talking about that because he dropped out in the ninth grade. He dropped yeah. out of school. Didn't even finish high school. Yeah. And he was just talking about how the structure of school is like, okay, you learn these mathematical equations, you learn some other stuff, but it's like, how do you, that, what part of that applies to an everyday job? Teach me how to start a business. Exactly. Teach exactly. me how to manage a, a bank account. Exactly. Like, bro, I got drafted with $7 in cash. Yeah. I didn't even have a bank account. Yeah. I had no clue what I was doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, why I should have been prepared. You know what I mean? Yep. It would have been nice to have some kind of preparation. And it, I think it's because they're just, school is designed. It's a system. It's a system designed yeah. to create workers. Yep. That's it. That's it. That's it. You're not designed to create like leaders and innovators entrepreneurs. and stuff like that. Yep. Entrepreneurs. Yeah. That's why most entrepreneurs are guys that just like, yeah. they hated school. I think like Elon, wasn't Elon, didn't Elon Musk like, drop out of high school or something like that or college I'm not sure. or something like that? I'm not sure. I'd have to fact check that, I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I thought it was like Elon, Steve Jobs. I've, I've read something like like a few a while back, but anyway, an article was listing out all of the very successful business moguls yeah. who never either never went to college, didn't finish college, or didn't finish high school. Well, it's, cause, it's because they – so I always say this, right? Yeah. You know, the wolf doesn't concern himself with the opinion of sheep. sheep. Yep. And I say that it sounds like kind of silly when I say it because yeah. it's my last name, but yeah. I always that always stuck with me from yeah, a young yeah, age yeah. because you see people and they all follow in line. Yeah. You know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And I just like, even in, at a young age, I didn't know what cutting in line meant. Right? Yeah, yeah, Nobody yeah. taught me that. Right? Yeah. So I remember like I was, I went to seven different elementary schools. Wow. So I remember I was at this one, I was like second grade, yeah. first or second grade. I never... I just thought you walked up and got your lunch and that was that. And it yeah. was this huge line. And I went up and just like started getting my lunch and it was like, Hey, you're cutting. And yeah. I was like, I don't even have scissors. What are yeah. you talking about? I don't have a knife. What are you talking about? I, yeah, cut yeah, anybody. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, thought, mean? <laughs> I had no idea what they were talking yeah. about, you know? And it's like, I see like, I never been one to like, just follow the herd. Yeah. And I think that that is true with like most successful people yeah. and entrepreneur wise yeah. and, um, and whatever field that they go into, they did, they didn't do everything the way that everybody else would do. Yeah. It went know? against the grain and it's, and that gets judged a lot. Yeah. And they get called crazy and it's because they're like, Oh, you're taking huge risks. Yeah. This and that. you're like, it's better. You better just get a job and do this and do that. Yep. Earn a get a 401k and get healthcare and yep. do this and that. And, you know, die with a, you know, die with a uh, retirement plan. Yeah. Get life insurance. Like, yeah. Dude, it's it's People like work this, towards that. Yeah, yeah, that's what, and that's there's nothing wrong with mm-hmm. that. You know, what I mean, you need. Yeah, we were talking about this this last week at Hunt Camp, man. Like, you need the guy at the gas station yep. that's going to come out there and and pump gas. Yeah, the guy that's going to clean the bathroom. You need those guys. Yeah. Those people are very important. Yep. For, essential. Yeah, it, to they're society. so essential yeah. to to society. You need the plumber. You yeah. need the plumbers. Yeah. You need the electricians. Well, which I would even say that those guys are even not sheep because they're like, I'm not going to go get a four year degree. I'm going to go yeah. to a tech. I'm going to go to a trade, trade school and learn. And, a trade. and reality is, those guys are making a lot of money. They're crushing plumbers it. and electricians, welders, electricians. Linemen. Yep, they, like those dudes are making yeah. so much money. Yep, and they have benefits and they have yep. all this. Like, if I'm a young kid without any real direction, I'm looking at that. Exactly. You know I mean? If I'm not an athlete or I'm not interested in the military, even yeah. if I am interested in the military, you could still do those yeah. things. As a matter of fact, a lot of people go in and they get those like welding jobs. Like some guys go in and they become divers. And those Navy. underwater welders make uh, and make bread. bread. Yeah. yeah. Hundreds of thousands yeah, of dollars. They're breaded. Like, Hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, I tell kids all the time, like, all right, kind of like what you were mentioned. If you don't know what you want to do and you know, and you're not like you don't even have to be patriotic, but you just want another chapter in your life where, where you can you can learn, grow, and figure out what you want to do. Military is great for that because you can get some of those principles that will set you up for the rest of your life. Yeah. Some of those lessons, uh, 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 attributes, the structure, you know, skill sets, the structure that can set even you up of for the military. Exactly. Uh, yeah. My brother-in-law is a chief in the Navy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And my wife always talks about how he just like 
was not cut out for school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now he is a Ru- he he learned Russian. Yeah, 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 and he can't tell us anything. He does. Yeah, 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 yeah. he's on yeah. a submarine all the time. Yeah. It's like, and it's like, dude, you're talking about the guy that like would rather play video games than go yeah. to class. You know what I mean? Because he wasn't interested. But once he got that structure yep. in his life, and he was talking about how basic was like going through basic w- with that stuff was just like so taxing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that it's like I'm not going to go through this and then waste it. Yeah, you know? exactly. So he, he took, you can, the military is awesome because yeah. it does give you opportunity yep. to learn something, learn a trade, yep. apply it, and then learn how to be a leader outside of that. And the thing is, he will never, ever be without a job. Right. Whether he's in the military or not, he will always have, especially the fact that he knows Russian, he has a security clearance for the most, I'm assuming, 99% sure he probably has a security clearance. He will never be without a job. Right. So his kids, his legacy will always be set up. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? For the rest of for the rest of their lives. Like my kids go to college for free, you know, because of my time in service. Like yeah, I, I can have three That's more kids. That's invaluable. Yeah. I can have three more kids, four more kids. Each one of them, their, their college is already paid for. Yeah. You know, as long as they're not making over a certain amount of money, you know, uh, each year. And so you can't get that anywhere else. No. You know what I'm saying? No. I don't even know if the NFL offers something like that for guys who are veteran, like their kids go get to go to school for free. No. Yeah. Hell no. They yeah. cover us medically for five years when we retire. And that you have yeah. to be vested. So the average NFL career is mm-hmm. two and a half years. And that's what where, where retirement kicks in? And retirement kicks in at three. Okay. So that's why you think the average yeah. is two and a half. It's all a game, man. It's yeah. all it's a meat market. So so dude, dude, I've always wondered about all of this stuff. So the average career is two and a half years, but you have to do three years to be able to get a retirement. Yeah. And every year you're in, does that increase, increase the amount of retirement you yeah, get? Yeah, your pension goes up, your 401k Got goes it. up. So you, you like I, so Peyton Manning told me this one. I was yeah. He said, max your 401k out every year. Okay. So now after 10 years, my 401k is, it obviously fluctuates with the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like on average, it's usually like a million bucks. Yeah, so yeah. when I'm 55 years old, you know, I should have, you know, a couple million bucks yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah. That should double, triple. It should yep. be like two or three million dollars. I'm I could pull that out and go have some fun with it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Invest it in something Invest else. Invest it yeah. into something else. Yeah. Or, you know, buy a you know, right now we're looking at these urban airs. Yeah. You know what those are? The urban airs are there. It's like, like out like outdoor house indoor park. indoor trampoline parks. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. They crush. So my yeah. wife is like she's an entrepreneur, right? Yeah, she yeah. Like, crushes it with real estate and all this other shit. Man, I I was like, look, I'll make the money. You go figure out what to do with it afterwards. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Hey, that's the way to do that's it. That's the way it's. That's the way it's been a really good set system. But, um, you know, the, but the problem is, is you don't get your medical. Mm-hmm. You're only covered for five years once you retire. So you're covered medically for the five years for five years after you retire. After and retire. Then after that, you, you're not. After that, you're on your own. Not even for CTE, any of that. Stuff. I thought. That, I thought with the whole CTE thing, they there was a new rule. They raised all kinds of money to like. But they ran out of that money so fast because there's so many guys with yeah. brain injuries. Yeah, I have seen. I have. Yeah, yeah brain I'm sure trauma. you do. Yeah, I, mean, I have. <laughs> I mean, you play ten years on the NFL yeah, and the yeah, NFL defense on the too. defensive line, You're hitting bodies every day, bro. Yeah, yeah. Like, bow, yeah. bow, bow, bow every day. You know, so yeah, there's gonna. But I do think I do mm. a lot of microdosing and brain mapping and mm. stuff like that to to help I'll reverse that. Yeah, 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 and it's working. Yeah, I can feel good. it working. Like, cause when I first retired, I was like, I felt, I was like, in I had terrible memory. Mm. Um, couldn't remember conversations that yeah. I had had the day before I was walking out to my truck and forgetting why I even walked out yeah, there, where I was yeah. going. Um, and I think that, I think that that was all attributed to that, yeah. you know? And then once, once I, I, I was doing that stuff while I was playing, yeah. I just didn't realize yeah, it. You know? yeah. I just thought I was like distracted with like, I'm thinking about, you, you, you were focused. You were just like you know? being on the op. You know what I mean? Being going on deployment. Yeah, you just, just don't like even notice it. To get it done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then when it was done, it was like, it all kind of hit me. Yeah. And then like the stuff with like the injuries in my inside my body. That's why I just keep moving. That's why I train yeah, the way you got I do. To. Yeah, I keep myself moving, and that's why I hike the way I do when I hunt. Yeah, that's why I love the bow hunt. I love I love all hunting. I just I actually did my first rifle kill. Oh, nice. I'd never hunted with a rifle. Yeah, but it was like doing. I did. I took a little long range course. Yeah. You know, up in Oregon yeah. recently, and I was like, man, this is kind of cool. Like this is hard. Like you have to be your consistency yeah, yeah, has yeah. to be on point yeah, yeah. to make these shots. These six seven hundred yard yeah, shots, yeah, you got to yeah. be consistent. Yep. You know, and you're tired. Oh yeah, and you're tired. Yeah, yeah. Probably yeah. wet. Yeah, yeah and it's not a perfect miserable. situation, yeah. right? Like you're sweaty. Yeah. Um, you're you're like 
keeping your hip, trying to keep your hips aligned with yeah. the target. And yeah. you've got a moving target. Like yeah. sh- it was a black bear. He just was moving up the mountain. So he wasn't. And you getting, hit it from 600? Or, he, you know, no, that was like 200 yards. 200 when I shot yards. Him. But we were earlier in the day. Yeah. We had, I had taken my first long range shooting class with my buddy. And yeah. we were shooting targets at like six, 700 yards. Wow. And he was like, dude. Most people can't yeah, just like yeah, walk out here yeah, and do that yeah, right away. I was like, yeah, well, you coached me and I yeah, took the coaching yeah. and used it. You know? And plus, you, you know, you've been in the NFL, so you get training. I mean, you have that mind where, hey, it's like the Matrix. Neil's like, teach me this. Teach me how to hit a person. And you, your mind has already been conditioned to learn. So now when you get to that point, it's easy for you to pick up those concepts. Well, I'm sure it was the same way in the military where they didn't yeah. want to tell you something twice. Yeah, 100%. Once yeah. you're told it one time, yeah. that should be enough. I don't yeah. want to have to tell you again. Yeah, cause, And that's like a coach's biggest pet peeve is when they have to continue to coach you on the same thing over yeah, and over yeah, and over. Yeah. So I just was like, I picked that up at a young age. Yeah, yeah. Like, you tell me something, I'm, I'm just going to remember. It. I'm going to get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like s- silly things, right? When I was a running, I played running back in Little League, and I would point my toes where I was going. Like, I couldn't, it was like my hips and toes would like kind of, Project. naturally drift that way yeah project yeah. where i was going and the coach told me not to do that yeah and i that stayed with me even in the nfl mm. if i was doing a slant i would never show or even look where i was going yeah, just because walk. it was just like ingrained in me from at a young age you know or like like little things like running to the football mm. like that was ingrained in me in high school mm. in college in the NFL, so like, so now it's just muscle memory. Now it's just like when the, when the, when I see the ball I'll leave the quarterback's hands, I'm turning and sprinting to it mm. because good things will happen when yeah, you yeah. get there. If you run to the ball, good things will happen. You know, yeah, pop yeah. out and squirt out there, and you get a fumble recovery, or yeah. you make somebody burp the ball up because you you know cracked him from behind yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. Like it's just, <laughs> and that's fun. Yeah, you know, that's like you get to catch somebody not looking. You know, because usually I'm the one getting hit, not looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so it's it's yeah, pain a man. Yeah. For it. All right, so let's so we we got a little off subject, but let's go back to um, the Bronx. Yeah, yeah. So what was that like growing up in there? So so in my early years, it wasn't um, like I said, my mom masked the reality of what had happened, so I didn't really feel it. It wasn't until I was about eight years old when I started recognizing things. Like I would, my mom would be like, "All right, you can go to the store, you can go, you know, to the, you know, to the park, to Vol Park, and play basketball." And the more I would go out and venture off, the more I would see things, and that's when I be- became conscious of the reality. Like I would go to the Vol Park, which was literally right across the street from where we lived in this co-op, and in order to get anywhere. In Fordham Road, whether it's a supermarket, you had to go through this park. Yeah. There's no, there's no going around it. You, you just would waste so much time trying to go around it. And it was, and so I would see crackheads in the park. I would see drug dealers selling drugs, people smoking weed, um, uh, people getting beat up, people getting jumped. Um, um, like I said, I would go into the store and see the mafia guys collect the tax. And then, you know, I, I would go to the rent office with my mom sometimes and watch her, you know, not pay rent, but pay the because uh, the co-op was owned, but pay the monthly fee, and she would have to pay for at beg for extra time to pay the bills. You know what I mean? And so the more I became conscious of my surroundings, the more I was like, "Holy crap!" Like I'm not in Kansas anymore. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't until I was around eight, nine years old. And I would say that the uh, event that really, really brought it to the forefront for me was I was playing basketball in Devo Park. I was about eight, and uh, I got beat up. I got beat up by a guy who just got out of prison. He was about 35 years old. And, and you were and eight years old? I was eight years old. And uh, and another dude who was like 18, 19 years old, I was playing basketball with this kid who was my age, and we were talking crap. You know, yes, we're playing basketball. I'm scoring. Oh, yeah. Hey, you know, I, you know, check. Uh, you can't guard me. And he's saying the same thing. And then when I started winning, he got, he started, the kid started to get agitated, and he told me to shut up. And I said, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to go get my brother. And, I, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't care. Go get your brother. You know, not, not like I'm eight, so I'm not processing everything. You don't like think he's going to get an adult? Is. Yeah, so yeah, I'm not, yeah, not even that. I'm not even processing that he's going to even do anything legitimate. I'm just like, oh, he's just talking. He's just talking, yeah. And uh, he was like, all right. And he went uh, across the street and uh, – about five minutes later, came back with his uncle and his brother and and him, and they beat me to a pulp. On slammed me on the concrete, spit on me, Kick punched me, in. and I'm eight. And it won't, like I said, the one dude was like 35 out of prison, you know. And so, um, it was events like that um, that really woke me up to where I was. 
and uh and uh that's when i really became that's when i really also began to feel the vo- absence of my father mm. because in my mind at that age i felt as though one if my dad was alive we wouldn't be in this situation we wouldn't be living here we wouldn't have this 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 life that we have and two if my dad was alive then he would be, have been able to protect me um and uh and as you know i think i believe i know i don't believe, i know every kid looks at their father as the protector like even now my my two and a half year old like she has a little nightmare she runs into my room at night you know my four year old same thing all my kids even my eight and nine year old you know they still come in when something happens or you know when we're out and about and they see somebody crazy like they you know walking down the street they you know come close to they me you know what I mean? because you. just naturally i'm the protector they don't do that with their mom you know what i mean like they do that with me but like my mom my wife will be with with with, with us but they'll Come to dad, yeah, because they know dad. It's their, in their, it's their instinct. Exactly, exactly. The male, the man is supposed to protect. It's the protector, yeah, He's the protector, the provider, provider. Like yep. all of that. Yep. And so I didn't have that. So imagine, I mean, you, you already know, I know exactly. You what already feels know, like. you know, know, exactly what it feels being like. a kid and 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 just this natural humanistic inclination to turn to the father, to turn to your father be like hey help me or protect me or not even turn like just look at your dad yeah and and you you already know he's looking back at you and he's got you so you know, i hate to jump ahead and tell the story but now that now that we're on this topic i'll just tell it you know a, like two weeks ago me and my wife were were uh having a conversation and she brought up to me that one of our neighbors uh was at the park with her her daughter and this other kid was picking on her daughter and the mom of the of the bully wasn't doing anything. The mom of the bully was just looking on and not doing anything. So finally, the mom, our, our neighbor, told the bully, like, yo, stop messing with my daughter, leave her alone. And then the bully's mom saw that, got up and stormed over to the mom, like, how dare you talk to my kid? How dare you correct my kid? Yada, yada, yada. She's like, well, she's your kid's been bullying my daughter and you haven't been saying anything. Somebody has to say something. I'm not gonna just let this happen. And when my mom, my mom, excuse me, when my wife told me that story, I was quickly reminded of of a the same similar very similar story that happened at that same park with my son like my son is my oldest son is 9 now so he had to be about 5 years old at the time 5 or 6 it was the same park same playground and it was this bully that was in the playground and he was just like being mischievous like pushing kids doing doing crazy stuff and I'm of the mindset that here's my philosophy Kids are kids. Their kids are going to do what they're going to do. If you're a parent, especially if you're a man, and your kid is going around bullying people or doing something crazy and you're not doing it, I'm going to whoop your ass. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm not going to deal with the kid. I'm dealing with you. I'm dealing with yep. you. I'm the same way. Because cause, cause the kid's going to do what the kid's going to do. You as a father. He's acting that way because of you. Because yeah. of you. You need to take responsibility. And if you're going to allow your kid to mess with my kid, I'm dealing with you. And so I was at the park, and this kid, I'm, and it's like picking on other kids, bullying other kids, doing all this crazy stuff. I'm looking around, like I'm trying to find His the parents, dad, yeah. the parents, and I'm not seeing the parents. I'm not seeing him run back to any adults or anything like that. Long story short, he he sees my son, and he taps his kid, like yeah, yeah, and points to the kid, and he and like to, to his buddy, like they're gonna go do something to my son. And I'm sitting there, why? I got my, my gator sunglasses on. So I'm just sitting there like, oh, <laughs> I'm just watching. And right when the kid was about to like, like two feet away from my son, I stood up and I just said like this in a calm voice. I said, hey, that's my son. And the little kid, the kid, the bully looked at me and then walked away. My kid, my son didn't even know what was going on. Yeah. He didn't even know what was about to happen. He didn't know what was going on. He wasn't aware of anything. He was just playing, you know what I mean? And, you know, that's the job of a father. Yep. You know what I mean? And every kid, whether they have a father in their life or not, they're always looking for that. Yep. And it also, it, not only does it come in the form of protection, like a father's job, but also affirmation. Yep. You know, it's a job of a father and a mother, but more so a father, in my opinion, to affirm your kids. Yeah. You know what I mean? To be like, son, you're doing great. You're awesome. You're yeah. going to be great. You could do it. Encourage Daughter, you. same thing. Because if you if you don't affirm your son, 
he or she is going to, your son is going to look for, he's going to look for affirmation from a, a, from a, from a person, a relationship, yep. so on and so forth. Same thing with a girl. If she doesn't get affirmed by her father, she, that just unconsciously, as she gets into her teens and makeup and all of this stuff starts coming in and hormone, she's going to look for that affirmation in relationships. Yep. And guys, and it doesn't matter how abusive the guy is or how toxic the guy is or how rude he is towards her, she's just going to stick with him. And that's going to that's, that's going to create this cycle of bad relationships. Yep. And before you know it, she's going to be, you know, single mom and all of this, and it's going to be a bad situation. And so kids need to be affirmed by their, by their dad. You know yep. what I mean? And, and I didn't have that. I didn't have the protector and I didn't have a father to affirm me. And so that situation was a big turning point in my life when I got beat up in the basketball court. Cause I came back home that night and that's when I actually broke down crying. And, um, my mom came into the room and she was going, she said, what's going on? And I said to her mom, like life sucks. <laughs> And it all sucks because dad's not here because I don't have a father. And in retrospect, I truly believe that that was the moment that I chose unconsciously to find a father to fill my void. Mm -hmm. And what was at my disposal at the time? We're talking early 90s, you know, Drug dealers, hip hop culture, mm -hmm. street culture. You know what I mean? Hip hop more so because not only did you have the music, did I have the music? from these guys who look like me, they came from my environment, they grew up in single parent homes like me, but they became successful. But not only did I have, or seem to become successful, not only did I have an audible you know, mentor, but I also had the visual through music videos. You know, and then I had the visual through walking down, you know, down the street or walking through park and seeing these drug dealers with this, with these, with money and selling drug cars and girls and you know people and they got the power and respect and all of that. So now that's like okay, that's my those are my fathers. That's what I'm gonna look to to father me uh, because I I can't get it from my mom. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, yeah, man. So so that that begin that's what that was when I I really began to sense the. Uh, you know the void, and, and I know you can relate because you see it in, in I, I see it in, in sports too, where you see a lot of these NFL players and NBA players. I mean, you can speak to it more so than I can. You know, they didn't have a, a dad, and then what have they get that that check? And what going making it rain in the strip club, buying all of these cars, Terrible, got the crew for dating the worst kind of women. Yep, dating the way do it. Why? Because it's all, in my opinion. It's affirmation. They didn't have a dad to affirm them, and now that they've risen into this big this status and they got this check, now they can essentially buy affirmation, mm -hmm. whether it's conscious or unconsciously. And so that that was that was that's what led to me stealing from jobs, stealing from my mom, then selling drugs, then from selling drugs to running scams, selling blow up phones, to doing all the crazy things that I was doing. And then by the time I was, you know, jumped from eight to to 18, 18, I'm some 17, 18, I'm selling drugs. 17, 18, 19, 18, 19, I'm in, in a big making like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a week on blow up phones. Yeah. You know what I mean? Selling illegal phones. And so, so you're just selling those trap phones. Selling trap phones. Yeah. You know, 90 days, stay on for 90 days, cut off. And then after that, drug dealers would come back to me, yo, I want another phone. And I would sell them uh, and, uh, and sell them not just to drug dealers, but other people and making crazy money. Sell them for anywhere between $300 to $900, depending on the, on the model of the phone. And so, but that all goes back to the absence of a father. Yeah. And I remember one time I, I, was, <laughs> I was like, I must have been 13 or 14 years old, and I was just out of control. My mom, like I remember my mom slapped me one time. And I looked at her because she would spank me and my brother, like not like in an abusive way. Like I'm just mad and angry. Like like yo, you screwed up. You, you broke the you know you broke the glass table. I told you not to play around the glass table. It's not fighting around the glass table. You guys were fighting around the glass table. You broke it getting the spanking. Right? There was always a reason behind you know my mom spanking us. And I remember I was like 13, 14. She couldn't spank me no more, man. Yeah. It was like, I mean, she, she could, and I remember when she, I, I did something, I cursed or said something, or I talked back to her, and she slapped me super hard. And I was just like, that don't hurt me. Yeah, that didn't hurt. That ain't nothing. <laughs> and she hit me again. I'm like, it don't hurt me. Yep. And she kept on. It was like, it didn't bother me. It's like, you, you can't control me anymore. Yeah. And this is, this is one of the, the, the biggest arguments I, or disagreements, let's say disagreements I have with my wife. Is is oh sorry 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 I have with my wife 
is with my sons. Because I tell my wife all the time, I'm like, yo, you can't, we can't let them get away with, with certain things. Because I'm telling you, when boys, it, will, boys will take a mile. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I tell my wife all the time, listen, 13, 14, 15, when they hit that age, you ain't going to be able to control them anymore. Mm. And the only person that's going to be able to control them, put that thumb on their forehead, is me. And, and you are going to be the one coming to me talking about they did X, Y, and Z, handle it. So you need to let me handle some of this stuff now, nip it in the bud now before it gets out of control later. Yeah. And that was what happened when I was like 13. My mom couldn't, at that point, she couldn't control me anymore. And I remember she called up my Uncle Kurt. My Uncle Kurt, he was in the Army Special Forces. And he's actually like, he's my, my aunt's, so my blood aunt, her husband. And uh, he came. He, he he came over one time. He's like, you know, you stepping on your dick, son. I never heard anybody <laughs> say that. <before. laughs> it was the funniest thing, dude. He's from the South. He's like, you stepping on your dick. You don't stop. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put you in check, boy. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I and that you know that kind of you know dialed me back for a little bit. But then after that, it's like. I'm back to normal. Yeah, if there's no consistency. There's no there, consistency. Right? If there's not there's not a yeah. consistent father figure there. Exactly. I mean, I was the same way at that at that age, man. Yeah. I just I remember my mom tried to put soap in my mouth one time. Oh, wow. and, and I just like laughed at her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like drank the liquid soap and <laughs> laughed at her. And then she tried to like tackle me to the ground and I was a wrestler, so I How was old like, you at the time? I was 11. Oh, yeah, yeah, And she's like 5'11". Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I bet you were already big at that time. And I was time. already yeah, big. Yeah, yeah. And she came in there and tried to grab me. She's, you know, she's always like yeah. a little bit messed up. So yeah, she yeah. would always come in there and screaming and yelling yeah, and getting yeah. physical with me. So like I was always on like, I was always in like defense mode. Yeah. So when things would go down, I would like defend myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, she would, that's why I, the beatings got bad with my stepdad. Because I would like try to wow. defend myself at, yeah. right at first. And then yeah. he would just beat on me worse, yeah. you know. Until I just, you know, he would choke me until I pissed myself mm. and passed out. Like, that's mm. the way he would like ha- handle me. Uh, they kick me and call me a pussy and then yeah. keep it moving. Uh, but she tried to do that to me one time. And I was <laughs> like, no. And she was like. I, she was like, she's like, put that soap in your mouth. I yeah. said, no. <laughs> and she was like, because I said the F word or some stupid, I don't yeah. know, something dumb. Yeah. Or I, I don't even know what I said. But yeah. she she comes f- like sprinting at me, like through the kitchen and into the, like the little, li- we lived in this tiny little house. So yeah, there was yeah. like three steps and she was on me, you know? And I just hip tossed her. I was like, boom, <laughs> right under the couch. And I seen her eyes go so wide. Yeah, yeah. She was like, oh, I can't control him anymore. Yep, yep. And I was only 11. Yeah. And I was already like acting wild at that age. I was yeah. skipping school. Yeah. I was robbing, stealing from yeah. the mall. I'd go to the mall, steal all my. She taught me how to do that. Mm. She taught me how to steal clothes mm. for school clothes because yeah. she couldn't buy them. Yeah. So I was like stealing clothes, skipping school. I was already sexually active with girls. Yeah. Like I was, I was, I acted Obvious. like I was, you know, 16, Savage. 17 years yeah. old already. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was taking care of myself. I knew how to cook my own food. I knew how to, so I, I mean, I would get my own, I fed myself. They yeah. didn't feed me. You know, I took care of myself, so I know exactly that feeling of like I'm in control. Yep, not you. When you, but you, but that was like a switch though. When you finally realized it, <sighs> I, it was you couldn't tell me. She yeah. didn't tell me nothing. There wasn't a thing she could do yeah. to try to even think about controlling me because it was so inconsistent. Yeah. Her love and her love was so inconsistent. Yeah, let yeah. alone her discipline. Yeah, you know, it was like so sporadic. I'd get away with things nonstop, and then out of nowhere, she would come in there and flip out, mm. and I'd be like, what? This has been going on for months. Yeah, what are you yeah, talking yeah, about? Why is like, it a problem now? Yeah, why is it a problem now? <laughs> you know, just because I'm in the way yeah. right now, you know, or yeah. uh, I'm, you're just irritated today. So that was kind of, that's kind of the way it was with, with my childhood. Um, so, what, all right. So when did you join the military? Uh, 19, uh, you, 19. You, gra- you graduated from high school. Graduated high school, barely. And by the skin of my teeth, just graduated barely. high school. And then um, um, was hustling out there making crazy money. And then long, I got involved in a deal with a drug dealer, sold him some phones that were supposed to last for 90 days. They lasted for like two weeks. And he was a, he was a big drug dealer, killer type cat. And uh, not only was my life threatened, but my mom's life was indirectly threatened as well. That was a huge wake up call for me. I pretty much gave him his money back. Uh, and then I was like, I gotta stop doing this. And that was kind of like another switch that went on for my head where I was like, if I don't stop, I'm going to either end up dead or in prison. Mm-hmm. And uh, there were people who were doing the same thing I was doing, and they were, they were getting caught and sent to federal prison. 
because that type of crime, white collar crime, you know, stealing people's personal information, social data birth, uh, you know, address and activating lines of credit as a federal crime. And so um, I was I had dodged a lot of bullets. And that situation was like the biggest one. Um, and so that's when I, you know, six months later, um, June of 2002, that's when I was like, you know what? more to the story but I was like I got to get out of here and uh, went to go join the Navy um, recruit around my background found out I had two warrants out for my arrest I had a warrant in New Jersey a warrant in New York and what uh, were they for? The warrant in New the warrant in New Jersey was for like rec like reckless driving like yeah. I was doing like 120 in like a 65 and the cop was trying to you know stop me but I wasn't stopping I, I wasn't evading him I just didn't pay attention i wasn't paying attention i was going so crazy crazy fast finally pulled over and then he was like why did you stop and you know you're going over 100 and you're going 120 and so and i never went to court yeah, in jersey didn't show. and then the other one was for uh, uh disobeying a lawful order and resisting arrest in times square you know uh uh yeah that was that's a whole crazy story situation um and i got thrown in jail and well, after I got out of jail, I never went to, never showed never the court. Never showed the court. So you and, had two uh, court dates pending. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, 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 yeah, and, 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 and the crazy thing is I didn't even know. Like, I'm, you got to remember. Well, yeah, you don't know. I'm like. They don't tell you. Well, like, you, you, get, you get stuff sent, you get letters sent to your house, your address. Yeah, but if you're not checking. But I'm not, you know? I'm not, I'm out here making money. I'm out here hustling. I'm not checking mail for this and that. And, like, and so, again, it's all on me. You know what I mean? I take responsibility for it, but that's what the warrants were for. And um, no, and then ran into the right recruiter. Um, she believed in me. Uh, she was from the Bronx, grew up in the Bronx, joined the Navy, left. And then uh, after she did some, I think like four or five, maybe six years in the fleet, then she decided to become a recruiter. And so she uh, was a recruiter and still in the Navy, <clears throat> serving as a recruiter in the Bronx. And uh, she just, she knew. She knew that, hey, nobody else is going to give this dude a chance. And uh, 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 and one thing that I found out years, because like, she died years later, like two years after she snuck me into the Navy. But one thing that I learned from her her brother was that she would drive around the Bronx and and talk to drug dealers who she grew up with, other people who were just out in the street doing nothing and say, listen, come with me. There's nothing out here for you. You're going to end up dead on prison. Let me help you get in the Navy. I could work it out. She did that with her brother. Her brother had some misdemeanors. <clears throat> and uh, she was in the Navy at the time. She was not recruiter. She, she, when you're a recruiter, you're still in the Navy. But she was stationed somewhere else. And then she came, she took a leave, vacation, went back to New York and helped her brother get into the Air Force. And that's what helped turn his life around. So that's what she was known for. She was like a Robin Hood. You know yeah. I mean? And so she took me to both judges, um, advocate on my behalf, and uh, both judges expunged my record. Ooh, and then she nice. went a step, uh, step further, fudged the paperwork, stuck me into the Navy. And that's how I got in. And uh, yeah, if it wasn't for her, <laughs> dude, like, I wouldn't even be here right now. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, You'd still be doing the same old... Dude, I probably they wouldn't accept it. I, 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 yeah. Be in jail. Oh yeah, dude. I get messages to this day of people who've read my memoir, like young kids and even like young adults, are like, "Yo, I've been trying to join the military for the last three years, or three months, or whatever the case may be. I can't get in. Like, no recruiter won't touch me. Like, I had this misdemeanor or I made this mistake when I was like 15 as a juvenile, and I can't get in. What did you do?" And I tell them, like, it's sad, but I tell them, I was like, just all about the recruiter. And a lot of recruiters are not like Tiana, where they're like willing to take a risk. Or do the extra work to try and take somebody to court to try and work it out so that yeah, they can get into the military. Clock. Exactly. And so, you know, it's it's sad, but yeah, she dude, I I, I wouldn't I wanna have my family, like I wanna have I wanna be a filmmaker. Do you still talk to her? She died. Oh, she died from yeah, what? yeah. She died from a uh, uh, autoimmune disease. Oh yeah, man. She died and she got me in in two thousand two She's an angel. Yeah, man. Yeah, but her daughter, dude, I'm like, talk about, you know, new family. Her daughter, her daughter's dad hasn't really been in her life. So, like, I've become like a dad to her. She starts college, like, in Good for a you, week. Man. Good for you. You know, her mom and her dad, Tiana, my recruiter, like, her, her mom and her dad, um, uh, uh, Sierra's grandparents, become like second parents to me. 
you know, I just did a, when I launched my book, Chameleon in uh, New York, like her aunt and uncle came out because they live in the Bronx. And so like, it's like our families have like come together. Yeah. You know what I mean? And she's like my, you know, her daughter's like my daughter. You know what I mean? And so, um, so sad, but at the same time, you know, a, a new new bonds were created. Yeah. Like life, lifelong bonds. Yeah. You know what I mean? So everything happens for a reason. 100%. I really do think that. And I really believe that. 100%. So what? So what branch? So you you joined the navy. Joined the navy, right? and yeah. so you just went straight to the seals. No, so um, I didn't. I I wasn't. I, I didn't even qualify to get in the seal training. So I'm just like I'm sure with with the uh, with that. I don't, I don't even want maybe even college like to get to play college ball like this. Certain qualifiers. Yeah, like you, one, gotta, you have to have play, been your recruited. GPA, it's a sliding scale, so like your yeah. GPA and your ACT score have to like. And if it doesn't match and you don't clear, you don't pass the, through the clearinghouse, then yeah. you have to go to like junior college. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you go to junior college and then a lot of guys made it, make it out of junior college mm. and do a big time, another big time school. Yeah. Yeah. And then they end up becoming great. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, it's just like another step that they had to take. So that's kind of like with me. So I didn't have the ASVAP. So we call it the ASVAP, which is literally is like an SAT or ACT or whatever. And uh, that's what determ determines your, what your job is going to be in the Navy. And so I scored high enough to get into the Navy, but I didn't score high enough to get in the buds. So I had that, you know, against me. Then also I was, I couldn't swim. <laughs> and you gotta, oh, yeah. Yeah, which so I had that <laughs> going against me. You got to pass a 500-yard swim in a certain amount of time in order to get in the buds. And then I was super skinny. Like I could, I could bulk up and get strong when I needed to, um, but I, I never really worked out. Yeah, and so just, now you and you don't have access to gyms and stuff. Oh no, like, it's not, no, 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 no pools in the Bronx, yeah, man. There's no, no pools. Stuff. There's yeah. no weight rooms. Yeah, and so like I had to go to junior college essentially. <laughs> I had to go to that route. So I went to my first command, which was Naval Hospital Camp Pendleton. And when I got there, I asked my LPOs, like my supervisor, and say, "Hey, listen, I want to go to Buds. Is there any way I can have time in the day to train?" And uh, and so she was like, "Yeah, absolutely." So. I worked four hours. I worked at the family practice clinic for four hours in the morning. And then, I, and then she, they, she gave me four hours off in the afternoon to train. And then I would come back to the hospital and work the night clinic. So you were in long days. Yeah, yeah. And it was a kick in the nuts, man. Like, as a matter of fact, I was just at Camp Pendleton yesterday um, and because I had to shoot this video. And, uh, like, I, I, my, my business partner who was with me, we, I was showing him the old hospital because it's abandoned now. And around. I would run three miles, like, from the hospital uphill to the pool, jump in the shallow and try to figure it out, run three miles back because I didn't have a car. And I just put in the work, man. I would go to the gym, which was always empty because um, Camp Pendleton's a Marine base, but the, the hospitals, like the Navy side of the base, is still governed by the Marines. But that's where most of the Navy people are, and Navy people, Navy sailors aren't really known for staying fit and working out like Marines are. So our gym was always empty. So I would just go in and like have it all to myself and create yeah. workouts and you know do circuit training. Like I was doing CrossFit before. Yeah, anybody knew what it was. Workouts. Yeah, because I because I was I, I watched this documentary called Buds Two Three Four in preparation, and I saw that um, in Buds there's no stopping. There's no like there's no rest. Yeah, it's like you do pull ups and you got to run to the surf zone and you come back. You got to drop down and do push ups. It's all like nonstop. And the guys who struggle the most are these like big bulky guys who train like hey they bench for and put the bar up and then you know chill. It's not and do functional it again. though. It's exactly and so I, that's like all right. I need to create all my workouts so that I'm constantly in pain. I'm constantly yeah. moving. It's not just like a. I'm not, it's not just um, like muscular workouts, but it's also a cardiovascular because I got to be able to do the pull ups, but I need to also be able to do a run. Then I need to be able to run back and do pull ups, and I need to be able to do push ups. So I just create all my workouts, and at the beginning of each of my workouts was you know was a test essentially. So like. For my pull up workout, pull up day, where I was trying to get my like, I would my the first part of it would be me maxing out, and I cr I created a log failure. Book. Just go to failure. Go to failure, and I created a log book. And every week when I did that, because I only did that workout once a week, the pull up workout, like I had to get like a week one, I only did one pull up. Then week two, I had to do two pull ups. Right. Then week three, I had to do four. And then gradually, I built it up where I was able to do fifty pull ups. And then same thing, I had a push up category. Then I had a one point five mile time run category. And I started each of my workouts with that time evolution that that, that was uh, 
part of the screening test to get in the SEAL training. And then after that, then I did my full-on workout. And so, man, I, I was just relentless. I got an ASVAP for Dummies book, which was like a SAT study guide. Studied that religiously. And then within a year checking in the SEAL training, I was checking out on my way to SEAL training. And you, so, so, so did you notice that like when you really started to apply yourself, how like, that is this, I can do this. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I, you know, I, I learned that early on. One thing that my mom would instill, like, be into me and my brother, not physically, was that, hey, you can do anything as long as you put your mind to it. It's going to be hard, but you, you, like, you, like, you could do it. And my mom, like, I, I was writing from the time I was, like, six, seven years old. My mom would make my brother and I, like, read New York Times articles and, and books and write reports. And the reports oh, had wow. to be perfect. And if they weren't perfect, then she would make us pick a brand new article or a brand new book and start from scratch. And she was like, I'm not gonna it. I'm not gonna make it easy for you where you get to like just rewrite that same article. You're gonna start all over again. And me and my brother hated my mom for it because she wouldn't let us go out and play. And we it's in the summertime, like all our friends would be out there playing. We lived on the third floor, so like our kids would come to the window, come outside and play, Remy. Come on, Remy. What your mom got you out there writing? Because you're yeah. stupid. Like I, you know, <laughs> like we were brutal to each other. You know what I'm saying? And uh, and I hated my mom for that. But what she was trying to instill in us is like one, whatever you do, do it right the first time. And two, if you do the work, if you, you like what, and you if you put your mind to it, you'll be able to accomplish anything. Anything. So I I had that foundation built from a young age and then fast forward to when i was like trying to be a seal i remember being at the hospital people were like dude like how are you going to be able to get in this there's no way you, you can't swim like like there's no way you're going to be able to get the seal training kind of like what people said about my dad like this like when my dad when um the government said to him what do you want we're not going to give you back marico my dad was like I'll take the swamp. I'll take the lagoon. It was like, what are you going to do with the lagoon? Don't worry about it. I'll take it. Like, I know what I'm going to do with it. Like, he was driven. And I think that, that that's, I, I definitely get that. I get that from my mom, but I also get a lot of that from my dad where, you know, I could see a problem. And no matter how big that problem is, and no matter how many people, like, say, hey, you're not gonna, you're not going to be able to achieve this. Just like they said to my dad, you're not going to be able to create an island. You're not going to be able to get in the SEAL training. Like, you can't swim. You don't have the academic. You don't have this and that. Like, I have a brain that's like, I'm going to figure out a way. Yeah, you don't let somebody it, – it, it's again. The yeah. wolf doesn't uh, doesn't concern himself with exactly. the opinion of the sheep. Exactly. They're going to tell you you can't do it. Yep. Um, it's a teammate of mine, Emmanuel Sanders. Yeah. Like, you know who Emmanuel yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But he, he's just like a – one of the best kind of teammates you could ever have, yeah, just yeah. a grinder and a dog. Yeah, yeah. And I had him on the podcast, and we were talking about they. Yeah. You know, they don't want. They yeah. told me I wasn't big enough. Yeah. They told me I couldn't do this. They yeah. told me, and we said, you know what? I don't know who they are, but thank you. Yeah, yeah. Because that is motivation. Yeah. Um, it's almost it's funny because I have this. It's almost like a blessing or curse when somebody tells me I'm going to be really good at something. Yeah. I don't even like really listen to that. Yeah. But when they say I'm not going to be good at something, yeah. I, I focus on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That like. They, th they don't think I can that's do dry, it. That's dry. That's fuel. Yeah. Yeah. They don't think yeah. I can do it. So yeah. it makes me want to do it even more. Exactly. And it's with everything that yeah. I do. It, yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's almost frustrating sometimes yeah. because it's, and like, I know I would be good at that, Yeah. but I like proving people wrong too much yeah. to even just go do something that's just naturally good. I'm just naturally good at it. hundred percent. It was like the podcast. A lot of people kept telling me to do a podcast. Yeah. Like, You're great at like keeping a conversation mm -hmm. going. And I was like, man, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I just kind of put it off because I was like, yeah, if it's something that I think I'm going to be good at, why do I want to take, why do I want something difficult? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But there's difficulty in everything. Yeah, 100%. Like, once you started doing it, I was like, oh, this is going to take time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, effort, and I think yeah. there's like, there's, if you go on uh, Apple Podcasts and look how many podcasts there are, there's, Millions hundreds of, of millions yeah, of podcasts. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's doing podcasts. But there's only a small, there's a small percentage where those people have like actually maintained that. Yep. There's, the, the, like ninety percent of those probably I, this is like a number I'm just throwing don't out. But I, I heard somebody say this that, that they only have like two or three episodes. Yeah, and yeah. They gave up. Yep. They're like, oh, I'm not getting the views. Yeah, I'm not yeah. getting Nobody's listening. Yeah. I only had fifty people listen or yeah. sixty people listen. It's like, dude, you got to start, start somewhere. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And if you keep getting better, yep. You know, and that's what I've seen is every episode gets better and better yep. and better. You know, I fix the lighting. I do yeah, this. Yeah, I change learn, something yeah. up. You know, yeah. you learn. Um, you know, tapping on the table, not yeah, making yeah, yeah, sounds yeah, yeah. like distracting. <laughs> no, I do, I do it bad. Yeah, like yeah. I tap, I'll tap on the mic. Yeah, yeah. Just because it's like nervous energy yeah. trying to get out, you know, because 
because um, you're active. We're active guys. Yeah, you come from an active background. Yeah, everything yeah. I everything I've done in my life is like active. Yeah, like, I could actively go train. I yeah. could actively go, uh, you know, lift weights and run and do it. Like when you talk about that high intensity interval training. Mm-hmm. That's the same exact kind of training I do now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I had to do so much like a football play is six seconds. Yeah, and yeah, you yeah, get twenty yeah. seconds rest. Yeah, so everything yeah. is like big power lift, yeah. big move, and then wait. Yeah. For to cut for a Recovery, while. Then yeah. do it again and yeah, then yeah. wait. And then do it again and then wait. And then when I was able to get into this uh interval training, I was like, Man, I love this. Yeah, because man. the whole time you want to quit. Yeah. Your brain is like, stop, yeah. slow down, stop, yeah. slow down. You need to rest, catch your breath, get your heart rate down. Yeah. But if you put when you push through that and then when you're done, the feeling of accomplishment and the feel the, like the endorphin drop that you get is yep. intense. Yeah. And I love it. Cause it's not just, it's not just a physical workout. It's a mental workout. Mm-hmm. And that's like, that's what I love about interval, different info, CrossFit interval, you know, hit training, but you're working your mental. I have a workout that I still do to this day. Uh, and I do it twice a week. And I literally I put the treadmill on 15 degrees and I put the the speed on for like three, depending on the treadmill. Like you know, when I travel, each treadmill is different. But between like three point nine and four point one, and people are like, oh, that's a, do it for an hour. Yeah, do that for an hour, bro. Talk about a mental workout. It it because your mind. You want to quit in the first you minute. You want to put your hands. Your your body's like, yo, put your hands on the bars. Yeah, and you're like, nope. So you you have to engage your mental in order to keep going because your body's like, dude, take a step off. Nope. Like you got, I can keep going. I've done worse. I can keep going. And and, and there's a, a version of the workout that I do. That's that's why even when I was training for buds, I learned not to train. But like on, let's just take the running side of things. I learned not to train by running outside. I learned to train by running on the treadmill, because and putting it on like a like I would do like I started out doing like nine point three. Like not when I just started, but when I finally got to a point where I, where I was a better runner, I would put it on the treadmill on 9.3. Like this is towards the end of my training when I was preparing to go to Bud's. I put the treadmill on 9.3. I would hold that for three and three quarters of a mile. Dude. Right? Bro. <laughs> bro. And then the last three to three quarters of the mile, I would put put it, I would max out whatever the treadmill is. So that last quarter of a mile, I would put it like if the treadmill max out at 10, I'll put a 10. If it max out of 12, I'll put on 12, and it's just a straight-up sprint. Yeah, you're just sprinting. And I didn't look forward to that workout at all, and I still don't look forward to that workout. But I tell you what, that freaking worked out, and I was not just working physically. I was engaging my mind because, dude, I'm I'm looking at the distance. Okay, I got like – I'm only like a quarter of a mile in, and I still got like you know yeah. you know three, three and three-quarters of a mile to go. So it, it, I'm constantly having to think. And then the same thing with like 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 my body getting tired or wanting to touch the handrails, and I think that type of working out is really good. swimming is another one where it's like it's not just physical; it's a mental aspect mm-hmm. to it, especially when you're swimming in cold water. Yeah, because you got to think about your stroke, and you got to think about like okay, if I if I have if I have stroke this. Like I'm not gonna get as far, or I'm gonna have to on my next my next stroke, I'm gonna have to put more effort into it, or I'm. All of these things start going through your mind. So you're having to think about every process of your stroke as you go and then the distance and then whether it's cold and then all of these other things so it engages your mind. So, yeah, so I think you're that, focused on your breathing, you know, yep. all that stuff. Yep, breathing everything. So so at what so how long did it take you to get to the buds? So I so I start I got to my command in January two thousand and three. I, I in in July of two thousand and three, I I I I passed the screeners. So I, I passed from an academic standpoint. I retook the ASVAP, scored high enough. Then I passed from a I passed the screening test, which consisted of consisted of a 500 yard swim, followed by uh, push ups, followed by sit ups, followed by pull ups, followed by a mile and a half run in boots and pants. So in six months, you probably crushed that. I yeah. I mean, the, the swim was I did a the swim time was like 12:30 I think at the time. I did that was my worst part of the test. I did it in like 11:30. But um, my push ups 100, pull ups, uh, uh, sit ups 100, pull ups were like 30, and then my run was like 9.30. Dude. Mile and a half boots and pants. And that's rolling. after doing everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, rolling. Yeah. And so <laughs> six more days, it goes to the mind. Mm-hmm. You know, I tell people all the time, and you can relate to this, is like when you have a dream, 
you're always going to have some deficiencies on your journey towards that dream. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called a dream, yeah. right? And you can make one or two choice, choices. You can throw your hands up and say, you know what? This ain't meant for me. I'm going to try something else. Or you could put in the extra, extra hard work in order to overcome those deficiencies to reach your dream. And and everything I do, even now to this day as a filmmaker, you know, trying to make a movie, you know, that's hard, bro. Yeah. Like, it's really, really hard. And, and just start writing the script. And after you write the script, like getting notes and having to do rewrites on the script. And then going from there to like trying to raise money to make the film. And then like, it's, just, it's, it's, it, and then trying to get actors attached and, and having people say they're going to do it. It's like, it's extremely hard. And it's so easy to be like, you know what, dude? It ain't meant to be. I'm gonna move, I'm gonna just move on to something else. I'm gonna go invest in something else. But then, well, yeah, because when things get hard, most people want to quit. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Most people are afraid to fail as well. Yeah. 100%. So, so like, there's always if there's no if there's no risk. Yeah. Then there's there, the reward is probably not very big. Yep. You know, it's um, and I think that I think that your life it's crazy because like just listening to everything that's happened to you in your life and what you've been through and that your mom making you write write those write those essays yeah, yeah right and the that prepared you for this yeah that you're doing now yep. but you probably were like why am i doing exactly. this yeah wax on wax off. yeah like, <laughs> why yeah it's like why am i doing this and then yeah. you go you go to but then you go to buds you get you pass through buds yeah you join the seals they teach you how to be a true leader yeah and you have that men, now you know how to lead men and me and people and then and, he, and, and everybody's he, different everybody has to be led in a different way you're yeah. dealing with men and women and yeah. um di- different political views yeah. different different this different that yeah and for you to be able to do all of that, you would have had to gone through what you've gone through 100%. and experience what you've experienced. Hundred percent, and even more so. Once I got into the teams, like I went, there's a specific job in the teams called human. Like each guy in, in, in a platoon has a specialization. So you got like your sniper, you got your breacher, you got your comms guy, which is a JTAC. You have your 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 your. Um, your mobility department, your lead diver, you have all of these different jobs in a SEAL platoon. And uh, my the job that a lot of guys, at least when I was in, tried to grab away, gravitate away from was HUMAN, which stands for Human Intelligence. And it's a, it's a cool course because, you know, you learn tradecraft, you learn how to run sources, you learn, like, all kinds of cool, like, you know, cool stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? And But a big part of it is writing. Mm. Because and, and 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 guys fail out of the course because of the writing side of it, and guys don't even want to go to the course because of the writing side of it. The last thing you want to be doing after you've had a source meeting, well, at least guys have a when you're on deployment and you have a source meeting, or you get back from an op, you want to chill. The last thing you want to do is write a freaking long report. Yeah. So when when I got to my platoon and my OIC was like, and there's a lot more to the story, but I'm truncating for the sake of time. But you know, when when I got to my platoon, my OIC was like, "Yo, we need some guys to go to human school." Guys didn't want to do it. I was like, my hand went up because I was like, my mom had me writing as a kid, so I was like, <laughs> I don't like I get to do the cool side of it, but I also get to write, and I love writing anyway. Sign me up. But I wouldn't have had that mindset. I wouldn't have been intrigued to do it or even open to do it if I didn't have that foundation right. that my mom kind of cr- helped create for me. Yeah, she yeah. laid that foundation for you. Yeah. So so how long did you serve? Uh, I did a total of 13 and, 13 and a half years in the Navy. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. a long time. Yeah, man. I know 10 years in the NFL felt, you know, yeah. I bet it flew by though. Yeah, it, yeah, it did because I was, it, yeah, 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 it flew by. There were times when it was just like Dragging slow. On. Oh, yeah, training yeah, camp yeah, for yeah. us. Like, Buds, like, yeah. Every, every year you go yeah. to training camp and it's yeah. like, oh, yeah. man. Yeah. It's six weeks of just like you're sleeping in some shit hotel. Yeah. And you're just kicking, kicking head nuts. butting the same guy every day. Yeah. You know, it's like, man, this sucks. But, yeah. um, but after after you get done, you're like, man, that flew by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, damn, a whole decade flew by quick. Yeah, thirteen right? and a half years went flew by, man. You know, and that, part of that too was when you go on the go on the pumps and you know go on those deployments and like the beginning of them was slow, like time wise, like time moves slow, and then once you get into your routine, routine, the routine of the pump, then it starts going fast. And then you know, once you get busy, it starts going fast. You know, and I was always busy because I was, I was 
doing the humid stuff, but then I was also going out and doing DAs, you know. And, and what does that? DA stand for Direct Action Missions. Okay. So like you know, going after HVT. So I I, I kind of lived the best of both worlds, where I was able to like meet with sources and help build these intelligent packages and write these. I have to do it with Rich required a lot of writing, and then you know, based off of that intelligence, at times got to go on operations. You know, so it was like I got to live best of both worlds, but I was always I got to stay busy. I always got to keep my mind engaged, and even yeah. when I wasn't like writing reports and, and and you know from source meetings, I was in you know in my room like in my hooch like doing research, learning about the guys I'm going after, like learning different things, learning things about the culture. You know, so I was always engaging my mind, and so that helped time go by fast as well. What was um, let's talk about some of your some of your missions. That yeah, you're on. can we talk about some of those? Yeah, yeah. Like, what was the first mission where you were like? Because I have everybody always asks me, what was your welcome to the NFL moment? Yeah, you know, yeah. like game game time yeah. moment. And I'll tell you mine yeah. real quick, and then you tell me yours. Yeah. So, <laughs> so mine was my rookie year. We're playing the Seattle Seahawks. Okay. And I go to shed a block, and the guy kind of like hangs on to my jersey. Yeah. Because I was tired, and I didn't like I didn't do everything yeah. that I normally would do, like chop his hands off me yeah. and like square up and make the tackle. Well, I get like halfway out there into the hole, and yeah. guess who's coming? Marshawn Lynch. Oh yeah, Dude, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he 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 was like a bighorn ram when yeah. he hit me, man. He like buck he like bucked up and like pow yeah, headbutted yeah. me right under my chin, and my helmet flew up and over my nose. My nose was busted. Yeah, and I tackled him still like back. He, he like he just tripped over me pretty much, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I tackled him, but when I got up, I was like, I never been hit like that <laughs> ever. And I was like, oh. He's okay, like I, take. I yeah. can't. They, you can't take a playoff. Out yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't half-ass anything. Yeah, out yeah, yeah. So what was what was your your moment like man. on a mission where you were like, oh shit, like this shit is real now. <sighs> man, I'm trying to think. Man, it was there's so many instances that pop out in my mind. I mean, obviously going on an op, you know, and and just going on my first op, you know, just, just even though I wasn't part of the ground force, just like being in the vehicle and then hearing overcomes, you know, jackpot, which means we got the guy. And on top of that, we pulled a bunch of like bomb making material off target. That was like, holy crap. I, I have kind of arrived. Like what, even though I wasn't like on a ground force going out and assaulting the target, which is going, you know, going, kicking down the door. I was yeah. in the vehicle on standby. It was still on target. Vehicles were on target. I was like, still felt like I was a part of something. Um, the other one would be when I first, my source, the first op that I was able to help, I don't want to use the word create, but help instigate for the most part via source uh, source uh, intel. And uh, I, on this particular op, I didn't go on this op. Um, so I was in the talk, which is a tactical operations center. And, uh, and so like I had built all of this, you know, had meetings with some sources, was able to build this intelligence package and then uh, uh, sent the package up the chain of command. The information got vetted against other intelligence, so it all checked out. And uh, and so, oh, I see guys at the top greenlit the mission. And uh, and I wasn't going to go on this one. I was going to stay on the talk. And so I was in the talk, which is a tactical operations center. And I was able to watch, you know, on a drone feed, watch the drone footage of the guys roll in and do the and do the hit and hit the target. And I was Man. and then they, when when they called jackpot, I was like, boom, because like the intelligence, it worked. yeah, the intelligence that I was able to collect and the report I was able to write played a huge role in you know sending things, you know, pretty much instigating and starting a mission. Do you think that um, doing things like that has helped you with you know the book writing, oh, the screenplay writing, one hundred percent, like that, one hundred percent? Because I had to write in a way where somebody could pick up my intelligence report ten years from. The day I wrote that report and read it as though those events happened today, that day, the day they're reading it. Yeah. I, I learned that's when I learned visual storytelling because mm. it is storytelling. You're having a meeting and you're collecting this information and you're having to now, you know, re regurgitate that information in a literal format and tell a story. Yeah. You know, that's going to have people say, okay, we can go on op or you can not go on op. And so that's where I really like my mom taught me how to write like from a grammatical standpoint, like, hey, you know, punctuation, yeah. and paragraph formatting, that kind of stuff. And doing the human stuff taught me visual storytelling, right. like writing in a way, because you got people who are fantastic writers, but they are not good 
storytellers as it relates to writing. Yeah. Those are two different, completely different. Oh yeah, it's, it's different. Different jobs, you know what I mean? It's like a quarterback and a running back, you know what I mean? Totally different. And so, um, so it helped inform me, and then the more like, you know, more I was able to do, and and then you know after that, I want to say my memory serves me right on that on that particular deployment, you know, the intelligence I was able to pull together, I was on pretty much every op, you know, and and then on top of that, there were times when I had to bring the source with me. There were a couple of times when I had to bring the source to confirm like locations or identity and stuff like that. And that's, and the more you, I did Man, that, I the bet more that's ramped intense. up. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Because yeah. like there. Cause it's, cause, cause one, I had to like, you know, without going into too much detail, I would have to convince them, Hey, we need you to go. Cause you know, most of the guys that I ran, the idea was they were not going to go on the op. The idea was like, Hey, we just got the information. Thank you for the information. And you know, We'll, we'll catch up with you afterwards. But, you know, there were times when I was like, you got to bring them on up. And they and I had to convince them because they were scared to death. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? And now, hey, we're going to cover. Because it is life or death. Yeah, we're going to put on a mask. Nobody's going to see you rolling out at nighttime, cover a darkness, and no way you're going to be able to be made out. And then boom, 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 we go. And I remember one time, this, I mean, again, I have a lot of surreal moments in part because I, I wasn't a guy that was supposed to be in that position. I wasn't supposed to be a SEAL. I wasn't supposed to be a SEAL and a human. I'm a kid from the Bronx. I was doing crazy stuff in the Bronx. Yeah. I was running from the feds and I'm like working with the feds. <laughs> and I would say another like big eye opening, like, holy crap, this is real, was when I had to convince a source to go on a, on a DA, direct action mission. And uh, and I, when I would meet with them, I was never in my kit and gear. It was always like collared, civilian collared shirt, civilian pants. You know, I had my pistol on my sidearm. Sometimes I'd have an MP5 with me or whatever, but it was like regular casual clothes. And, uh, and that, so do you think that would help me. make them feel more comfortable? Oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Because you, you know, you want that. There's a lot of different layers and levels to it as far as like making a source feel comfortable without going into detail. One of them is, you know, your, the way you're dressed. The way you, you dress. And another thing that helped a lot too was, I mean, less than 1% of SEALs are African American. I was like around the 50th in the history of the SEAL teams. And then once you get into the human side of things, because already less than 1% are African-American, that number dwindles down even more. Now we're talking of a fraction of a fraction. So most of the sources that I ran, I was the first black dude that they even freaking ever had an exchange with or an encounter with, or in some cases even saw. Yeah. Right? And so they were able, there was that buy-in sometimes because, you know, they, we were in the, I was in the Middle East for the most part. And so... I'm a darker skinned guy. They're a darker skinned guy. And it's like, oh, like, brother, brother. You know I mean? <laughs> and, then, uh, and then a lot of them watch, you know, uh, uh, you know, Western mu movies, American movies. Yeah. And, and they all know all the comedians. They know Chris Tucker. They know Martin Lawrence. They know all that stuff. Yeah. So then they're like, you know, they would kind of banter with me about that sometimes. But then, but again, that helped kind of, you know, break the ice in a lot of cases and, and help make them feel comfortable when they saw, oh, this dude is not like, you know, some Harvard trained, you know what I mean, frog man. It's like, hey, tell me what the guy is. Like, I'm, I'm different. And I felt like I could identify with them because they're in a war-torn country, in the hood. You know, I grew up in the Bronx in a, you know, very volatile environment. So we had that connection as well. Yeah. So that really helped me do my job. And so, you know, like going, going back to this particular mission, like it helped, my background helped me convince this dude to go on op. But I'll never forget, like, he was like, all right, I'm going to go. And I was like, all right, I'll be back in, like, 10 minutes. And I came back 10 minutes later because this all happened on this on the base. And I was now, you know, helmet, body armor, you know, uniform, collar up, you know, weapons, ammo, grenades, everything over me, <laughs> you know, on these suppressor silence on my, on my M4 and all of this stuff. And he was like, <gasps> you know, he was like, holy crap. And he was like, this is real. And then that's when, in my mind, I'm like, it's real as well. I mean, it was always real, but it's even more real, real, because now he understands even more so how dangerous this can be, which means that I have to take this even more serious. Yeah. And I have to add more safety precautions and put more safety precautions in place. Because you're playing with his life. Exactly. This ain't about just some information to go get a bad guy. This is about this guy. Not only can he die, his, his entire fine family can be executed. You know what I mean? So it was stuff like that that also was like, dude, this is serious. This is real. And, you know, we went out, got, you know, when his intel checked out, caught the bad guy, wrapped him up, and, you know, got a bunch of intel off target. And uh, uh, we were doing vampire ops. So we, we would we would wake up like around 5 p.m., and that's when we would start work. 
And then we go out at like, you know, Work at night. one one two in the morning, you know, uh, midnight sometimes and, you know, not come back until come back before the sun's up. Yeah. <laughs> come back before the sleep. sun's up. Yep. So you're go on like you know, oh, man. Yeah. Just a, it's so different. Yeah. So what is um is there a mission that sticks out as like the most impactful? Like one uh, one that yeah. just I mean, they're all impactful, you know, but was there one where it's like, man, we just like yeah, stop I, something really crazy. From yeah, the the, we, the one would be you know, and again, I'm I'll, I'll touch on the one that I touched on in my book, but just to kind of you know, not put extra added information yeah. out there, but um, the one would be there was this particular guy, age high, huge HVT type dude. I mean, this was a big dude. We had been tracking him. At, high value target. High value target. Yeah, he had been tracked even before we came in country. Before we took over for the previous platoon and uh couldn't get him because he had so many people in pocket so many people i mean you know from the police to the i mean he he, he was like a connected dude and so we went on an op one time early on in deployment um guy and tell that he would be where he was where he where he ended up not being but his brother was there wrapped up his brother and obviously, from that point on, he left town. Like, he was just like, I'm out of here because he knew we were tracking him. And that was his SOP. If, if an op went down and that op was, to, the point of that op was to capture him or wrap him up, like, his SOP was to, like, move. Like, move yeah. to a completely different location. And so, towards the end of this particular deployment, <laughs> I'll never forget it. We were, I was asleep, I was asleep because it was a daytime. It was like, 11 in the morning, 12 and 12 in the afternoon, something like that. And my interpreter hits me up and he's like, yo, so-and-so source number, whatever is on the phone. He's saying that he has eyes on so-and-so dude, dude's back in the area. It's like, and I'm half asleep. I'm like, yo dude, like, I don't want to, I don't want to go freaking chase my tail. Like, I'm not sure how, how accurate this, this is, this, this is going to be. I'm not doubting his information, but even if he is in town, like, what's the likelihood of us catching him right now? So I started to go back to sleep, and and then, like, something told me, like, dude, pursue this. So I was like, ah, got out of bed and uh, <laughs> uh, went, knocked on my uh, interpreter's hooch, and I was like, yo, call up, call back so-and-so. Call him back. Confirm. He's like, yeah, dude is at this place right now. I got eyes on this car. parked, like, right here. His bodyguards, everybody's here. He's back. So... Long story short, got a drone overhead. Oh, I see, got a drone overhead. Um, source marked the target, marked the guy's vehicle in a specific way. He won't say what, 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 that, what, what way that was. So the drone was able to now follow that vehicle. We, we went out, I want to say like around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, which we hadn't done this entire, we hadn't done a DA this entire deployment in the daytime. And it kind of worked in our advantage because – he didn't suspect us to ever try to go after him in the daytime. He knew that, you know, even like I said, the previous guys that, go, that went after him, the SOP was at night, you know, snatch, quick snatch and grab, sneak in, sneak out. So he felt safe moving around. So he the day. felt safe moving around in the daytime, you know. And on top of that, if he suspected anybody was coming anywhere in his area in the daytime, he already knew police or whoever, the local, you know, lookouts are going to radio him, be like, yo, some and so going to come in, come in your way. But that worked in our advantage because, you know, there were other patrols from other forces, conventional forces in this particular area at the time. So to him, it was like, oh, just another patrol. Long story short, rolled up on target, and it was just supposed to be a quick hit, turned into a uh, 12-hour op turn into a 12 hour race, you know, from foot to vehicle, foot to vehicle, but the drone was on him the entire time. And that's how we were able to always catch up with him. And it's like uh, that chopper. Yeah. Whenever you see a, a police chase, oh, the yeah, chopper yeah. just kind of keeps eyes on them yep. and they think they're going to get away. Yep. They never do. Yep. And then, but this thing, the drone's like what? 10,000. <laughs> yeah. It's air. way up there. It's small. Know. So they haven't even seen it. And, uh, uh, at one point my YC was just like, dude, we ain't, we're gonna stop playing this game. Let's just wait. Let's drones on him. He's not gonna be able to get away. Let's just wait till he's got to go to sleep at some point. 
So drone stayed on them, and we just pulled over like in some desert area and just sat there in our vehicles until like one in the morning. And then, uh, uh, you know, got some reinforcements, got some more guys. Rest of our platoon met up with us, and we went. Hit, 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 you know, he was out in the middle of nowhere, like farmland, farm country, nowhere. Like we, we dismounted. I don't even want to know how many miles off, but like it was, we we had to hump in at night. Like it was a long hump, and then we got him. And I would just say that that to me was 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 a huge. It was very fulfilling because this dude, like I said, he had been he had been tracked for a long period of time, and he was. He was responsible for doing a lot of bad stuff. Yeah, you know, um, recruiting kids as suicide mm-hmm. bombers and just a lot of just stuff that um, just the worst kind of just evil. evil evil type stuff. Yeah. yeah, and so to be able to wrap that dude up, that was probably one of the most fulfilling things, at least for me. Man, that's so crazy. And then, especially on top of that, going back to the writing, having my writing and source handling. You know, going back to what my mom instilled in me, hey, if you could articulate your thoughts in a literary format, you'll never be without a job. You'll be able to do it and you'll be able to do your job with excellence and seeing how that applied to that and played a role in getting that dude and getting him off off the streets. That was that that was probably that's huge. man. Impactful for me. Yeah. Good on you guys for doing that. Yeah. Because I I mean, that's just. Talk about just the impact. You, I mean, how many kids did you save? You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you can never even know. Yeah. How many people did you how save? How many people how would many? have never been born? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. All right. So, so you get, you do all this amazing stuff and you learn so much. You keep your writing up. Mm. You're learning how to lead. Yeah. So what, what do you do after you, so you decide, okay, I'm, I've had enough. Yeah. And so my first son was born in 2014. Okay. And my tw- my second son was born in 2015. And um I had to make a decision in in like towards the end of 2015 like do I stay in, do I re up or do I get out? And so many people were like, "Yo, dude, stay in. You just need to do what, you know, six and a half more years, you know, to get a retirement. Well, yeah, six and a half more years to get a retirement." And again, like I I have this mind like my dad where it's just like everybody's like kind of like we were talking about with school like you got to stay in school in order so you can get a job and get insurance and do x y and z and i like i couldn't i couldn't compute with that like my brain was like no like you could do other things like you don't have to stay in for another six and a half years in order to like get a retirement like you can do other things and still be successful and that's what was the that was the one thing that was on my brain was like no I, i feel like i could do other things and greater things and and not and things that are gonna set me up in my future in a better way than, you know, doing an extra six and a half years and getting a little retirement. And, that spending, I probably, and yeah. missing a huge chunk of your child's and, and life. Yeah, and that was a huge, that was the biggest part of it, like missing like those important years, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, you know, especially my dad dying when I was five, like I wanted to be home. It wasn't, mm-hmm. I wasn't fearful of death. I just wanted to be present, Yeah, you know, and it's the, here's a crazy thing that I always thought about before my first two sons turned five, I, like I would always say, like I need to make it to, to one and five. I need to sorry, I need to make it past like six, seven, eight, nine. Like it was just I like because I, I felt like I was living vicariously through my kids and now having a yeah. father. You didn't want to repeat the cycle. You wanted to break yeah. that cycle. But it was it was more than that. It was like this weird like spiritual thing where I was just like, I want to see what life is like for them after five. Yeah. I get it. I get you know it. Because I, mean? I didn't have that. Yeah. And I was like, I know it's weird, but that, that was. No, like, it's not. It's, it's like, not weird, dude, because I yeah. can relate so, so much. I do it with my daughter. Yeah. So like when I did something, when I, I had like, I got terrible ADHD. So yeah. I'm like always doing something. Yeah. And I see myself and my daughter a lot yeah. because she's always like goofing around. Yeah. Always playing, like always playing little jokes and tricks and stuff. And I would do that and get like just screamed at and yelled yeah. at and told to shut up and stay out of the way, this and that. And I catch myself sometimes like getting irritated with her. Mm, yeah. And I'm like, why? I'm like, hey, I'm trying to do something. Like, let me yeah. do this, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, but then it's like, well, hold on a minute. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I hated that feeling of yeah. being like dismissed. Yes. And, like I was not seen or heard or yeah. the inside so seek negative attention. Yeah. Because any kind of attention was better than no attention, yeah. you know? So I, I started noticing myself 
um, getting frustrated with her. And I'd be like, Hey, give me, you know, I'd look, Hey, give me a second. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And then she'd be like, you know, whatever. And just go do her thing. Yeah. Well then I, like, I remember the first time I did it, I was like, hold on a minute. Like, yeah, yeah, I yeah, stopped yeah. everything I was doing. I went and grabbed her. I was like, Hey, yeah. and I explained to her, if you just give me three seconds yeah, to yeah, yeah. finish this, like this one little conversation I'm having on the phone or yeah. just give me, just give me a second to finish this sweetheart and we'll do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Like, and then I've noticed, I saw how that resonated yeah. with her yeah. and just to even at like a two year, as yeah. a two year old yeah. it resonated with her. Yeah. And I was like, wow. Yep. I was like, this is what breaking the cycle looks yeah, like. Yeah, 100%. That's what it looks like. 100%. You know I mean? Because so, all of those little things, like even like, what is it? Um, it's like the first eight years are of a child's life is when they acquire like most of the attributes they'll have for the rest yeah. of their life. Their subconscious like is, is developed. Their yeah. self-worth is developed. Yep. Like all of that stuff yep. is developed. And it's all about how you talk to them. Yeah. And how you um, how you handle like like last night, right? She 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 does this thing where she like my wife is really the disciplinary. Yeah, like she's the, even Roxy, my daughter Roxy, she'll yeah. say she'll be like, "Mommy's the boss." Yeah, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, "Yeah, she," you know, yeah. because it's like it is. It's yeah. true. Yeah, I can't discipline you her the way that my wife can discipline. One hundred percent. That's right? where it's the same head. way with your son. Yeah, right? like you can't dis your wife can't discipline yep. your sons the way you can discipline. Yeah. You probably just look at them wrong and they, you know what I mean? Yeah. But me, like, it's the same with my wife. She just looks at my daughter yeah, and she's yeah, like, yeah. oh, I'm in trouble. Yep. Yeah. You know, but me, she thinks it's a joke all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Cause yeah. I'm always goofing yeah, with her. Yeah, yeah. Fun dad. Yeah. yeah. So I'm always <laughs> having fun with her. So she yeah. like, when I am trying to be serious, she doesn't take me serious sometimes, yeah. you know? So, so like last night she wanted to get up out of bed after I'd already put her to bed and she had fallen asleep. She gets up out of bed and I see, and she's like walking out of, she knows don't, you don't leave your bedroom. Yeah. If you need me, you yell for me and yeah. I'll come in there. No, she's like walking out into the into the, the living room, and I'm like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and then she's like, "Oh, I'm just like I do what I want, you know, basically." Yeah, type yeah, thing. I was like, "Uh, uh-uh. yeah. I'm like, get your butt back in bed." <laughs> and she thinks it's a joke the whole time, you yeah. know what I mean? And it took for my wife to come in there and be like, you know, to like take kind of take over, yeah, yeah, yeah. because I, I was like, I don't, I'm at a loss right now. I'm the same like, way. I don't want to yell at her, yeah. right? You know, because it's like I well, guess girls like, is different. You can't bro. yell at them before they yeah. go to bed. Like yeah, it's, yeah. that's really bad for their nervous system. Yeah, because sometimes they just have to like wind like, down, wind down. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. But like I don't know. I thought she had wind down. We've been in the pool all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've done all this stuff. Like I thought there's no way she and she was tired and whiny, but she just for some reason wanted to be like in the mix. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And so my wife comes in and gets her to go to bed, and I was like, she comes in, and she goes, "Hey, that was like a learning moment, yeah, moment yeah, for you boy, yeah. to like." you did a good job of not just like, you know, losing Blowing your cool with yeah. it. She was just not listening to anything I said. Yeah. You know? And I just was like, what can I do? Yeah. I just laugh at her. You yeah, know, yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah, you're not going to listen to me. Okay. It's, it, it, you know, it's so funny. Cause like with my daughter, I'm the same way. I'm like, cause all I have to do sometimes is just look at my daughter. She's two in the grand and she's, she'll be three in October and she'll just start crying. Mm-hmm. Right. So, like I can't spake her. Like I can't. I, no. like, I, 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 I can't do any of that I stuff. I can't to even her. like grab her yeah. aggressively. I can't. Yeah, I can't <laughs> like, do none of that stuff with her. So it's like she knows that daddy is like she gets away with a little bit more mm-hmm. with me. With them, but my wife, with my daughter, is like she's the one that's like the disciplinarian. Yep. You know because she's just like you're not gonna do this. She'll yell. I can't even raise my voice to my daughter because she'll just cry. Yeah, I'll yeah, do the same yeah, yeah. with me. And you know, and the other and thing is, is you don't want you don't yeah. want her to think that that's how it's okay for a man to that's talk what to her. I was just about like to say. That's like, exactly. Yeah. I, I just have no. You notice that? Yeah. Like some women, like my wife, her dad is like the most gentle. Yeah, yeah. My father in law is the most gentle, like understanding and loving yeah. father ever. Right. Yeah. So like, if I raise my voice with my wife, she is like she's not used to it. Yeah. Not she does not like she feels like attacked yeah, right yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. she's like, whoa, what yeah, yeah. the hell is going on yeah. here? You know, and it's like. I don't want my daughter to think it's okay for some, a man to yell at her. Same here. Same or to here. like get physical with her or to, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, and I do that with my wife. Like when she gets, we get in an argument. Yeah. I just, I remove myself yeah. from before it gets loud. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause I don't want my daughter to see that. Yeah. I don't want my kids to see us like, cause we are, you're going to get in an argument. Yeah. hundred percent. Like, yep. It just happens. Yep. Right. So it's how do you deal with that argument? Right. So yeah. sometimes I'll just be like, you know what? It's best to walk it's away. It's best for me to just walk away yeah. from this one. You know, because not every battle is worth fighting. Yep. You know, and you, I'm going to lose most of the time. Anyway. My wife's yeah, six yeah. years older than me and a lot yeah. smarter than I yeah, am. Yeah. So <laughs> she's going to out. She's going to out argue me every yeah. time. So I'm just wasting my 
wasting my breath most of the time because yeah. I'm usually probably wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's what I've learned is that, you know, if there's one thing I've learned, we're usually working on uh-huh. me. Yeah, I do. I'm <laughs> the same way with my wife, dude. It's just like, it's just times when I'm just like, and I know her so well now, which I'm sure you know your wife so well. Like, I just know that there's no winning. No. I know that there's times when it's just like, I know, like, if I say certain things, she'll be like, oh, okay, got it. I didn't see it that way. But well, other things, I'm just like, there's no going. There's no going. Bad. So You're it makes no sense. You're not going to convince her otherwise. Yeah, there's no, it makes no sense to just to keep trying time. to argue. You know what I mean? It's like somebody has to be the bigger person and the leader. That's leadership. You yeah. know, like what you said, like what you do. Like, you know, it takes leadership to be like, hey, you know, I'm going to just dial it back. Like, that's not weakness. There's no, no weakness in that at all. That's like a leadership decision. And that's something that, you know, I, I do at times with my, with my wife when we're getting into it about something. It's just like, you know what? It, pride says, keep on, say this, say that. You no, know, you're yeah. right. You got to prove you're yeah, right. Yeah. You but know? leadership is like, you know what? Let's just let's just put that aside and not even talk about it anymore. It's not even worth it. It's, it's not, not worth it. getting anywhere. Yep. It's not worth it. Yeah. Um, and being dismissive and things like that. Yeah. It's never going to work with yeah. a woman. Like, 100%. It just doesn't work with them. Yep. Uh, you know, cause men, we just want to kind of get through it. Like yeah. what's the quickest way through? Yeah. It's a logical approach. What's the, yeah. yeah. What is the quickest way through this? But yeah. then they're taking an emotional approach. Yeah. So it's like this whole, this whole game that you have to learn yeah. with women. And I'm like, it's crazy. Cause I got to get it from three angles. Yeah. Right? So yeah, I, have yeah a, I can't imagine I have a, a grown woman <laughs> yeah, yeah. and her emotions. Then I have a teenager, teenager. with her emotions. Yeah. Then I have a four year old yeah. with her emotions. Yeah. So I'm just like you got three different tiers yeah. at all times, man. And it's like it's it's making me such a well-rounded human because yeah. I'm like I'm not so I used to be very confrontational. Yeah, like yeah. I would not if somebody was if I would swing first and ask questions later. Mm. You know, like that's how I was taught. Well, to, that's how you were raised. I was raised with your parents. Like yeah, you didn't. If yeah. somebody started jawing at you, you just yeah. had, you go ahead and swing first before yeah. something bad happens. Yeah. You know, uh, and and now and learning how to like deal with like a, a frantic four-year-old yeah. who's like losing her mind because she can't wear a certain dress yeah, or she yeah. can't she wants to wear a ball gown to school i'm like you can't wear a ball yeah. gown. you can't wear a bell dress to school yeah, yeah. like you know it's like come on let's, yeah. you can't wear you can't dress up like elsa it's yeah. not halloween we're not going to disney world yeah, yeah. yeah. just that way you know uh you can't or like going to the pool she wants to wear it she calls it a topper but it's a two-piece uh-huh. suit, right i let her wear that in our pool yeah, yeah it's just yeah. us there but you're not wearing that yeah yeah out you're not public, wearing that out yeah, in public yeah. no yeah. Um, so I have to like have that argument with her and yeah. it's, and learning how to, you know, when I was a kid, it was shut up and do what you're told. Yeah. 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 You know, and well, you I, can't do that now. You, can't especially that with kids, with girls. Yeah. No. And so I like listening to her reason yeah. why she wants to wear it so bad. Yeah. And then I tell her why she can't wear it. Yeah. Then she eventually is like, Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I, get I get it. it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. But if I did, but if we're like in a hurry, sometimes I'm just like this, okay. I got to take 10, it's going to take 10 minutes yeah, to get yeah. through this, but well, let's just do it. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Cause it's a teachable moment. Yep. You know, so, and, and they'll look back and appreciate that. Yeah. The kids will look back and appreciate that. They'll appreciate the, you know, the tender explanation that, and you didn't have to give, which again, that yeah. goes back to leadership. You don't have to do that. You can just be like, yo, shut up. Just do what I told you to tell you to do. Yeah. You well, people, I mean? people would say, you know, I had a lot of teammates that were like, cause they, they were like, you were wild. Like yeah. you can't, it's so crazy to see you being a girl dad. Cause yeah. you were so wild. Yeah. And so like mean and aggressive as yeah. a player, you know? And I'm like, I'm, and they're like, wow, she softened you up, huh? Yeah. And I'm like, no, I don't, I wouldn't call it softening me up. I would call it like, she's, I learned so much about who I am. Yeah. 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 She just showed you a different side from of her. Yeah. You know what I mean? I learned about like my full potential and, yeah. and it's been, I, my full potential has been just like, just gushing out of me. Cause I yeah. didn't know what unconditional love was. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what yeah. that felt. I did not know what that yeah. felt like yeah. until yeah, I felt own. that that lo- like once she- it wasn't even when she came out. It was the first time that she was like scared, yeah. Or the first time that like she just said "daddy," you yeah. Know? Like, and she just hugged me, and yeah. I was like, "Whoa, this is what I'm- she'll love yeah. me no matter what." Yep. Yep. Like the the feeling, like that feeling was intense. Yeah. For me. Yeah. And you know, I I just I will protect that at all costs. 100%. You know what I mean? And I'll do everything I can to make sure that like. She knows that I would. I want her to see. I want her to marry a man that I would approve of. One hundred percent. So, yeah. like, if I don't know, if I can't look in the mirror yep. and approve of the way that I treat my wife yep. and the way that I treat my kids, yep. Like, you I damn sure can't uh, expect my kids to go any other way. One hundred percent. I have to be that example. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like a huge, I mean, that is, that is where the, the father figure, like we were talking about earlier is missing from a lot of yeah. these homes Yeah, and we're seeing it Yeah, in the way that these kids are acting. Yeah. And it's, it's sad, man, because you know, all it really takes is just, 
it, it's not that difficult. Yeah. Like it really isn't like a, a, considering all of the other things that I've done in life and yeah. I, what I've gotten through and how, what I've pushed through and what I've excelled at, like being a dad is, is not that difficult. Like all you have to do, they don't even really want you to yeah. do anything. Yeah, yeah. Just be there. Be present. They just want you to be there. They just want and you to put be your present. phone down yeah. and be there. You yep. know what I mean? They don't care. They're like, they're not like, hey, work eight hours you know, to provide. They don't even think about that stuff. You know no. what I mean? For them, it's just like Well, yeah, she's present. always like, why are you, you know, like the, today, right? Yeah. So my wife's in New York. So it's, it's daddy-daughter time. Yeah. So I got to have the nanny come so we can, you know, record a podcast. And yeah. she's like, I'm like, I'm like, baby, daddy's got to record a podcast. Yeah. And, that. and she's like, well, why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, because it's what I like to do yeah, for work now. Yeah. And she's like, well, why do you have to work? Yeah, 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 and I'm like, well, because I like yeah. to provide nice things for you. Yeah. She's like, well, why? And yeah. I'm like, well, do you like all these toys, right? Yeah, you like all these dresses. Yeah, you yeah. like going on trips and all that stuff. I was like, How, we have to pay for all those yeah. things, you know. And she's like, she, it's I could see it at first when she was like two and a half, three, and I would explain that yeah. to her. She just didn't get it. Yeah, but now, yeah, she's like really understands. Like, oh, I get it. Daddy goes to work and yeah. I get nice things. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that, that, dude, I have to have the same conversation with my kids because, like, I work like when I'm not working on a film or TV project. Like, I'm I'm in my office, my home. I have an office in my house, and uh, and that's where I do my writing and meetings and all that other stuff. And so we have a nanny that comes from eight thirty to four thirty, and my two older kids during the school year they're at school, but that's the uh, same exact schedule that. That I'm on. Oh, what's your yeah, name? Eight thirty four. Yeah, thing? yeah. That's what I, that's when I, that's when I, my day starts, and so it's interesting because they come into my office and they know that like four thirty day. Yeah, four thirty, four thirty, uh, and they'll come in at three thirty. Four thirty. Yeah, four thirty, and they like and at three thirty. Some of my youngest son will be like, Dad, why do you have to? Why do you have to work till four thirty? Why can't you just get off early? And I saying things like, Dude, you like living in this house, right? Your brother's like going to their private school, right? Yeah. yeah. Like toys, like you gotta explain. Like, like I gotta explain it to them, and then I it, and it happens like at least once a month when I got yeah. explain. But then it's like, trust me, four thirty hits, they ain't gotta worry. My you wife, she works part time. So my wife works. She's a doctor. She works every Wednesday and Thursday. Oh, she's a doctor. Yeah, she's a doctor. What kind of doc? What is she? Family practice. Oh wow. So she cradles to the grave. So she works every Wednesday and Thursday and every other Friday. So I like I feel like I'm blessed when I'm home because I'm with them. For, from the time they wake up, which is like around six thirty, until eight thirty, so it's good quality time. You get two then, good hours in. Yep, you know what I mean. Yep. And it's the same way with me. Yep, and then from four thirty until my wife gets home, like at seven o'clock, six thirty, seven o'clock, I'm with them. You know, so it's like, and then I get to see them throughout the day. You know what I'm saying? Like I get out, and sometimes I go and I'll sit at the table with them while they're having lunch, or they'll come over to me when I'm sitting at the yeah. table having lunch and stuff like that. So I got that good quality time with them. But even with that. To them, like we were talking about earlier, they you know it's, it's hard for them to understand. They don't care about the work. No, they don't. Which care is about fine. It. They care about you and being present with you, which is super important and valuable. And and, and and again, it sets the foundation for their relationships moving forward. You know, for who they are and right. who they'll become. But then also their relationships and how they choose those relationships moving forward for the rest of their lives. Yeah, yeah. Choosing a choosing a man that's gonna. That, that works yeah. hard. Yeah. And whatever it is yep. that they do, just yep. works hard. Yep. And there's a balance there. Like, uh, you yeah, know, how many, I, there's a lot of really successful people and their kids are just screwed up. Yeah. 100%. Because they didn't, they were, they thought they were doing the right thing by trying to provide like this wealth, this generational wealth. Yep. But they were neglecting the love and the time and the, yep. just being there for them. Yeah, they, they were neglecting them in that way, but they, in their mind, you know, and I get it because in their mind, they're thinking I'm just grinding so I can like make sure they don't have to want like I yep. wanted, you know, and you get addicted to that grind yep. where you're just like locked in on that grind and you see those kids, man, they're just like, they're drug, drug addicts, addicts. And they're, yep. you know, they're just so, and just so out of touch with reality. Yep. And it's because of the way they were raised. Yep. They were raised by nannies and stuff. And that's the thing. I don't want my kids to be yeah. raised by nannies. Yeah. So like that's why the morning, when you talk about like that morning time, that is yeah. like the most precious time. Yeah. Because I, I wake up at 530 in the morning and I do like, I give myself like that hour to two hours by myself. Yeah. And I'll check emails and, you know, respond to things. And mm -hmm. like, you know, my life now is like social media and, yeah. and hunting and yeah. uh, podcasting. So I'm like looking at that, looking at who, who do I want to have on next? This yeah. and that, you know? Or uh, which which hunt is going to be, you know, 
the bet, the coolest one to go on yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and what collaboration is going to be the coolest thing. So I'm, that's where I'm like, yeah. cause my brain is like so active when I wake up, yeah, 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 yeah. that's when I can do it, you know, have a cup of coffee. Then I go wake my daughter up and I let my wife get her little extra sleep. You yeah, know yeah, I mean? yeah. And then I, and then I, cause she runs the whole show. Like she's the CFO. Okay. Like I, I come up with all the cool ideas and yeah, stuff yeah, and, and she, she manages makes it, it yeah. happen and yeah, yeah. keeps it all legal and yeah, uh, yeah, keeps yeah, it all yeah. buttoned down. You know, cause yeah. me, I'm just like, crazy train going, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and she's like reeling it all in yeah. and making it all like a reality for me. So we've got a really good uh, partnership, team, yeah. partnership and chemistry. Our team chemistry is really good. It's awesome. Like we know our rules in this, in this, in this game. And that's like another thing as far as being like a, a, a football player. Like I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know my role. Yep. Right. I know what my role is in this house. Right. I know what my role is um, in my business. I know what my role is as a husband. Yep. So like knowing your role. Yep. Your jabroni. Yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. know your role. Like, yeah. you got to know your role. Yeah. And Every, operate in and, that role. And operate yeah. within that role yeah. at the best of your ability. Yeah. Um, anticipating, like, needs of some, of others. Like, that was hard for me because I only focused on myself my whole life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, you bring another person into it. Just yeah, yeah. Be getting married. I was yeah, like, hold on a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean I can't just go do whatever I want? Yeah, yeah, when yeah. I want? Yeah. She's like, no, motherfucker. You yeah. don't get to just go do whatever you want when you want. You yeah. know? So it was like, that was a sh- shock to me. Yeah. So I like- How old were you when you got married? Uh, 26. Okay, yeah, you were young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I was young. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I had already, I'd lived such a, yeah. I'd been in the league yeah, for yeah, four CTA, years. Yeah. You know, I, I'd been, I'd, I'd lived the life. Yeah. And I knew what I wanted. I knew what I was, I thought, that's the other thing. Money and all that stuff, that shit is not going to make you happy. No, it's not, not at all. Whatever void you're trying to fill- yeah. That shit is not, figure out what that void is yep. and fill it with purpose. Yeah, with the right things. Yeah, with the right thing because uh, I did. I bought all the fucking expensive yeah. watches. Yeah, and the fucking dime, bust down AP. And yeah, the fucking, yeah. uh, to the kilo fucking Cuban link chain. Yeah, yeah. I bought all that shit and it did nothing, <laughs> nothing for me. Nothing. It did nothing for but, me. But, but, but burn your money but out. Burn money. Yeah. Waste money. Yeah. You know what I mean? What What I learned was that experiences and relationships and friendships yeah. and stuff like that were were more important. And to me, ultimately, what's made me happy is my fan is having yeah. an actual family because I never had it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's what I was like trying to fill in that hole was a family filling yeah. like that that family need. I was just shoving things in there, cars and oh, I'll buy a Lamborghini. Yeah, That'll make yeah, me happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, it didn't make me happy. Yeah. It was stupid. Yeah, you know. Oh, I'm gonna buy a watch or I'm gonna buy this. I'm gonna go to Vegas and get a table at yeah. this club and go to this strip club and, and do up. this yeah. and party and buy these bottles and it's like. Hundreds of thousands of dollars wasted, but it was like the best education I could ever learn on like learning who I really was and figuring out who I wanted to be, you know. And And that came from like we talked about earlier. You didn't have a dad to really, I mean, you had a stepdad, but he was was terrible. You didn't have a dad to affirm you. So unconsciously, you're going out and doing all of these things and, you know, spending this money and you look back on it and it's like, why did I do that? Yeah, it's because, you because I didn't looking have for, Yeah, you're looking for that dad to be like, or a friend, or somebody to be like, yo, you the man, you this, you that. Yeah, you're looking and, for affirmation. Yeah. And then like, and then when it was all the dust settled and I finally met my wife and she was like, she just saw how big of a heart I had. Yeah, and yeah. like, you know, I was able to like, I felt like I could be vulnerable with her and this mm-hmm. and that. And she was like, you have a lot of people in your life that are taking advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And I was like, what do you mean? Uh, she's like, they're taking advantage of you. Yeah, like yeah. They're, you're basically paying for friends. Yeah, yeah, yep. And I'm like, and that, that was like a hit to my pride, you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? So I was like so confused. And then when I saw it, when she was like showing me cold hard proof yeah. of like, look what they did. Yeah, yeah. I had friends write a forge a $1.3 million check. Damn, I got the man. money back, but you know, I missed out on like, yeah, yeah. I, I missed out on a good, a good stock market run. Wow. Where that probably would have doubled. Yeah. You know, so it's like, it's like things like that that she was catching, and I was yeah. like, "Man, like she really, she really does care about me." Yeah, because she's able to see it from a perspective that you can't, because you're could. just so stuck in it. Well, because I'm just like looking for somebody yeah. to love me. You yeah, know what I mean, exactly. that's what it is. You just want somebody to love you yeah. and, and care about you and 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 support you. But what you really need is somebody who's going to hold you accountable, yep. and that's what I needed. I needed yeah. nobody ever held me really held me accountable. Yeah, I just yeah. was like, I was good football player. I treated people pretty, you know, I've treated people, this, everybody I treat the same. I just yeah. treat everybody the same, and that's how I got through life. I try to, I believe in karma and this and that. Like, yeah. I feel like if you do the right thing, the right thing will come back around. Yeah. So I just, 
if, if I don't have a problem with you, yeah, yeah. if you don't have a problem with me, I don't have a problem with you. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. once you have a problem with me, then we can have a problem. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's kind of how yeah, it was. Yeah, mindset. And then like realizing that like that's so stupid to waste time on that and to like let it go. Like people are gonna hate. Uh, you know, another thing Emmanuel said one day. Yeah. You know, he's like, my uncle told me one day he's got ten haters. He said, tomorrow I'm trying to have eleven. <laughs> you know? That was like that's that a was, good one. It was such a good one. You that know? means you're doing something right because you're doing something right. Yeah. If you don't got somebody hating on you, then are yeah. you even doing anything? You're not. I never. Deion Sanders says this too. Yeah. I never met a hater doing better than I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah never. Yeah, yeah. And I haven't. Yeah. I've never met somebody. Like whether it be like on a social media post where they yeah. just like they these narcissistic people that just like can't wait to go in there and try to ruin your parade. Yeah. And like point out some stupid stuff that like they can't wait to do it, right? I don't let that bother me because I'm I'm if I didn't have that hater, then I probably am not doing the right things, yep. right? I need yep. to like I need to step my game up, yep. right? I need to start doing more and, and push, you know. So it's like to me that's like a it's like affirmation yeah. in itself that yeah. like, Oh, you're hating on me. Yeah. yeah, yeah there's yeah, a reason. Yeah. Yeah. You hate me cause you can't do what I'm doing and you yeah. don't have the mindset to do what I'm exactly. doing. Exactly. You don't have the, you're scared, right? You're there. They're most of them are scared. Yeah. It's like that song, man. Uh, did you see that new music video? Broski hear that new song broski with, um, uh, uh, what's the guy's name? Um, I know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm the whole blank music on. video is about yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, Luke, no, it's, uh, I forgot the rapper's name. Um, anyway, it's like, it, it's so spot on about I like. To, I have to look it up. Yeah, look at, look at it. Uh, it's so spot on about how you have these people in your life and they say they're their friends, but in reality, they're hating on you, man. They're frenemies. Yeah, frenemies. That's what my wife calls them, frenemies. Yeah. And then they're trying to steal from you, you know? It's What's that song called? Broski. BR uh, Broski. Oh, uh, is it Joyner Lucas? Joyner Lucas. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. Joyner Lucas. That, that, that song is spot on, man. Like, every, like, it's heavy. Yeah, I'm looking at the lyrics right now. I, yeah. Check it out. Check it out today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely check that one out because yeah. it is like spot on. Yeah, with what we're talking about. Yeah, but you know, I wanted to circle back on you know something you brought up because this is something that also fascinated me. I watched a documentary on ESPN. I don't know, maybe like twelve years ago, called Broke. Yeah, and like, how is that now? Like, are guys more educated now? Are they to, are they still? Because oh I think at the time it was like seventy percent of NFL players and eighty percent of uh, it's, it's financial NBA players. Yeah, it's eighty percent. Like go you're, broke you're, after eighty percent guys are going to go broke. Wow! And it's it's financial literacy. Yeah. And it's discipline. Yeah. It's you're it's crazy because you're so disciplined within the game. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. But then now outside of it, you just are like most guys are coming from broken homes. Yeah, man. like yeah, they like don't have any. About, yeah. Guidance in the yeah. public school systems are not teaching you how to manage. Like yeah. I said, they're not man teaching me how to manage a checkbook yeah, yeah. or how to. What is a dividend? What is an yeah, depreciating yeah, yeah, yeah. asset? Yeah. What is a what is a, a liability? Yeah. What is the, what are these? What is this? Things are just things, and then you buy all these things thinking, "Oh, I could always sell it." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, you can't. I don't. All these custom jewelers yeah, are yeah. making you this one-off piece of jewelry that yeah, you yeah. can never sell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one's gonna buy it for what you paid that yeah. hundred sixty thousand dollars you spent on that. Yeah, yeah, it's worth like twenty. Yeah, because it's got diamonds in it and all this other stuff. It's worth whatever you break it down as. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So it's worth the weight of the gold and the diamonds. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's not worth anything. Yeah, right? yeah, so yeah. like, if you're gonna buy a watch, buy a plain Jane watch that is sought after. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then hold on to it for a lot of years. Yeah. And pass it on to your kids. And then, and that's how you buy watches. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I didn't I didn't know. I was like, I'm gonna buy one with diamonds in it. You know, like an idiot. You know, it's so dumb. Yeah. And I like the the value dropped like half just wow. because of the diamonds, you know? Yeah. And are they are they aftermarket diamonds? Are they yeah, you know, all yeah, these other things? Sicoli, whatever. Are they <laughs> are they lab created diamonds? Yeah, yeah. Like they can they're creating diamonds in a lab now that show up as the same breakdown as yeah. like a regular diamond. Yeah. Uh, so it's just like the, as the far as the guys going broke, right. It's like, I'm sure it's the same way in the military. There's, you get out of, you're done playing and I don't know. It probably isn't the same, but you're getting paid six, you're yeah, getting paid yeah, eight yeah. times a year. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you're getting these huge checks 
every two weeks. What's the eight? Why is it why eight? Times 16 a year? games. It was 16. We were playing 16 games to get paid every two weeks. Okay, got it. So every, so every other okay, week. Got it, got it, got getting, I thought it was every week for some reason. Some teams do it that way, but okay. I, every team I was a part, I was a part of two teams, but yeah. those two teams were always, yeah. always every two weeks. Got it. And it would just be this huge influx of cash coming mm-hmm. into, your, into your, and it was like, you, you feel like that's never going to stop. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then while you're making that money, what are you doing with it? Are you spending entourage. the prince? Are you spending the yeah? But not even that. It's like, are you spending the principal? Are you putting it into? Are you working with a good financial advisor that's like putting you in risk free dividends yeah. Yeah, that yeah. you're going to earn five six percent no matter what? Yeah. Like, what is the what's going on there, right? And so many guys are just living off of the principal mm. that when they get done, they keep living off the principal, and, then they and they're like, out. hold on a minute. And you're like, how did you how did you blow through sixty million, right? How did you blow through that? Well, easy <laughs> because he's living off of a hundred thousand dollars a month. Mm. Okay, how many years is it going to take for that to run out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just his bills. Yeah, yeah, or a hundred yeah, yeah. grand a month. Yeah, yeah. And if he would have just had those that sixty million sitting in sitting in risk free dividends, yeah. he's earning five six percent. Uh, we're talking about he's able to spend probably five million a year, five or six million a year. And never touch his principal, and then it'll double in seven. Mm, yeah. But he's not. He's just sitting in cash, right in the bank, and he's like working the stock market a little bit, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and not really doing shit with it. It's like kind of breaking even. So like that. G- next thing you know, he's spending one to two hundred thousand, and then he's not playing anymore because when you're playing, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're not really spending during this. You're not going. Yeah, anywhere. You're, you're going doing, to hotels you're just and yeah, yeah. So now you have a whole years of spending that kind of money instead of like. Mm. You know, instead of spending a hundred grand a month every month, and then like three or four months of the year, you spend an extra fifty grand that month on like a trip or yeah, like yeah. you know this and that. And, well, they're just spending a hundred and fifty, two hundred grand a month every month, mm. and next thing you know, you're busting through two million a year, and then you got you know you're paying then your house and you're just like oh, I'll just pay the house off fine and pay the house off and you take a loss on another house and you yeah, have all taxes, these assets yeah. and then taxes and then next thing you know you're left with like a couple million. And everybody's looking at you like, how'd you lose all that money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like still trying to keep up that lifestyle. And every time that you dig into that principle, your lifestyle gets knocked down a notch, notch, another notch. And people don't realize that. Yeah. And they just keep spending principle. And next thing you know, they're left with nothing. Mm. And everybody around them that was spending their money and taking money from them is like, you're an idiot. And they're gone. And they're gone. So it's a so to this day it's still eighty percent of NFL players. Pretty sure, yeah. I'll look it up. That's crazy, man. And what is the retirement though? Like for so, a guy who's like, what, what what can you max your retirement out as? So that's the thing. The retire. So I can. That's the other thing. You can borrow against your like to, if you start a small business loan. Yeah. I like I, like with these uh, urban heirs. Yeah. I'm gonna take us a, a bit a. SBA loan out against my retirement yeah, yeah, yeah. because I've, it, I could do it tax yeah, free. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's like my my four hundred one k is at like seven hundred thousand. Then my um. Well, I don't. I didn't mean your retirement as in like your four hundred one k. I mean like because the, the NFL the pension, gives a, gives you a get a pension. pension. Yeah, you get a is pension. That, so that's not enough for guys to survive on after they well you the money running. Well, out. if you start taking your pension early, it's taxed at like forty percent. What's early? Like any time before fifty five. Oh, so you can't start drawing until fifty five. Yeah, forty five is like the minimum they tell you to take it. And that's for like, NFL players. Yeah, got it. And, and a lot of guys. And here's the problem: they, they a need lot to, of guys aren't even making it to fifty five because of the CTE. Of the CTE yeah. and they're not taking care of their bodies, mm. and they're not like they get. A lot of these guys get done playing football, and they're just like they don't work out anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. don't take care of themselves. Yeah. They don't eat right. Yeah. They just blow up. They have bad, they have heart yeah. failures and all this other stuff going yeah. on. And joints all jacked And next thing you know, they're 55 and they are just like a, a vegetable. So some of them are just like, I might as well take my retirement at 45 and cut this because I might not even get. Yeah. And then they just the blow it too. They don't do mm. anything good with it. It's a sad man. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's is a it, huge learning curve and it's a lot. It's like, it's, it is a lot to learn. I can learn in a playbook like that. Yeah. But like learning this financial game. Yeah. And this entrepreneurship and then learning like algorithms with YouTube and with, you know. You should, with, you should think about freaking starting some type of, or you and your wife starting some type of business where you educate these guys. And, they don't, uh, dude, they don't care. No. They don't want to hear it mm. until it's too late. I'm mm. telling you, I was mm. that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was that yeah, young you know. guy sitting in there in those financial meetings. Because they give you, they yeah. have meetings on 
with like every a, year or they have meetings like just, just when you're a rookie, rookie camp and okay. rookie, as a rookie yeah you know and you're just like what are you talking about yeah you know like what you, i'm trying to focus like and they do it at the worst times of the year yeah right? they do it like during training camp when you've had a long ass day yeah, you just yeah. want to sleep yeah and you're just like not retaining any of the information that's coming at you huh. right? so you got to believe that they know that they know they so, know. so what they trying well, to do? What they, so, what they trying to do is they trying to again. I, I'm not trying to come off as a conspiracy theorist or anything like that. But what they're trying to do is not trying, maybe not indirectly trying to do. But part of the process is okay. If these guys burn through their money, then they'll be more hungry to play harder, so that they can make more money. I mean, that's part of it for yeah. sure, right? They don't ever want you to come up. I mean, you got to think, you're already taxed half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're taking 50 cents on the dollar no yeah, matter what. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You're already getting, you know, federal taxes. You're a W-2 employee. You yeah, can't write anything yeah, off. Yeah, uh, Your training, any of that. You can't write any of it so off. So they don't let you guys do, like, uh, 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 set up LLC or S Corp and have the money go through that? Nope. Wow. Nope. See, they ain't letting us do that in the film and TV industry. So I don't get paid anything for anything that, whether writing, directing, acting, none of that stuff goes through. To me, that all goes through my corpse. Eighty percent become bankrupt within the first three years. Wow. Today, and that's up twenty twenty three up today. Yeah. Wow. That's that was crazy. Published May ninth. Mm. Is that just NFL or is that NBA too? That's that's just NFL. Mm. I don't uh, the NBA. I'm sure is the same. Yeah. It's usually the same. That's sad, man. It's really sad. Yeah. Um, and it's because it's because guys are just bad business ventures yeah. too. Like they think they're doing the right thing. Yeah, People yeah, yeah. take advantage of you, and that's when you're playing. That's that was like the best advice I ever got while I was playing was that focus on what you're doing now. Yeah, yeah. Don't try to do all these other business ventures while you're playing yeah. because you can't pay attention yeah, to it. Yeah, you can't focus on it. You can't put your full attention and know everything about it. Yeah. And the next thing you know, you're, you know, these guys are losing. Millions. You know, look, here's reasons why. Reasons why 80% of NFL players go broke. This is a Sports Illustrated article. Number one. Child support. Lack of competent financial planning There advice. you go. That's the biggest one. There are so many dirtbag financial advisors yeah, yeah. out there yeah, 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 that try yeah, yeah. to take advantage of these yeah, guys. Yeah. They, they just take a little percentage kind point. They're not really earning them anything. They're just... Kind of like it, like like, or like uh, at military bases, especially like outside of the recruiting uh, bases, like when I say recruiting, I mean like where guys go through like boot camp, it's all of these car dealerships. Not, not like Nissan. I mean like actually like janky, you know, no credit, bad credit, come buy a car. And they're right there, right outside the bases because they know that these kids, once they get out of boot camp, they're going to want to buy a car at any, and they don't care whether they have the money or not, whether they have good credit or not, they're going to want to get a car so they can drive around San Diego. And on top of that, the ships. So when guys go on deployment, they come back after those six months, what do they have? Twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in their bank account. What do a lot of these guys do? They go straight to these dealerships and buy cars. So it's like these, like the financial, the bad financial advisors, right? They're set up right outside when these guys, after these guys get drafted and they, they got their system in place. Hey, let me get this guy on board. And I had a, I wanted money. to buy a Range Rover when I was young. And, uh, this financial advisor I was working with, I fired him because I found out he was in cahoots with the Range Rover dealers. Mm. <clears throat> and I was going to be paying like he was going to make 25. I was paying an extra 25 grand for this car wow. without me even really knowing it. Cause wow. I didn't understand what a, what a, what it was signing. Yeah, yeah. And I never signed it. Luckily. Because who somebody had look at it was like that's very yeah, it's, yeah. So number two reason supporting a village, a crew. They feel entourage. obligated. To, they feel obligated. They do. Yeah. To, to take care of the people that help them get to where they're at, right? Yeah. Financially. Now, did you did you have like nobody? Just me. I didn't have to worry. That was one thing I was grateful for. Yeah. I didn't have to take care of anybody. But you were talking about like you had some people that would try to take a one point three million dollar forger check. Oh yeah, those were guys that I. Those were guys I played football with. Oh, so these, were, so these were, that's what I'm saying. So and they lied about being so a CPA these, and they lied about. God. So, and yeah. that's why I was getting it. Like a lot of these, the entourage are typically people you grew up with from your neighborhood. Yeah. They follow you. It's not college. all, it, not everybody has that uh, fairy tale story like LeBron. Yeah. yeah all yeah. his boys came along and they made him Did money right. and yeah. made themselves money and yeah. everybody's making money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like that. They were all looking for a way to, to, do, Poach, to get yeah. it done. And then number three, divorce. Mm. Divorce. Yeah. They said, 
It's put, a, put often cited a- as a number one challenge. It drains funds and legal yeah, fees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alimony, and dissip- child support. It dissipates uh, assets, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you have yeah. Child yeah. support and alimony. And, and like, then they, they, the, the wives can get the uh, retirement too, right? Don't they oh, get a potential? They get all of it. The pension? What a, they get everything. Dang. Everything. The pension. Yeah. There's a thing called line of duty. So for however many injuries you had and, and this and that, like I'm, it's a bit, it's a point based system. Yeah. And they try to keep it from me, but it's like six grand a month. Okay. Yeah, they get yeah. half of that. That's to see in the military we have the same thing we call a disability, and so the the, the most you can get is like forty five hundred a month, yeah, tax free. It's tax free, but your spouse can't get it because it's disability. But that so your disability, your spouse can get half oh, of yeah. that. Your retirement, everything. That's crazy, man. So here's one that's really really good. Lack of preparation. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. for a second NFL career or a second career after the NFL. Yeah. And I bet this is something that's so prevalent in the military big as time, well. Big time. Because what do I do now? Yeah. And everybody thinks that like, oh, well, I'm a well-known figure. I could do whatever I want. Yeah. And then they'll go into that without the same work ethic they yep. went into like making it into the NFL. Yep. And wonder why they fail. Yeah. Miserably. Yep. You know? So it's like you you have to take that same I take that same work ethic with this podcast. I take that same work ethic with my hunting show. I take that same work ethic with the businesses that I that I am creating yeah. um, with my wife, with real estate, with yeah. everything that we do. I try to take that same yeah, you have to. drive yeah. to succeed and want to succeed. Like you have to want it more than you want to breathe yeah. that next breath. One hundred percent. You have to want it. Yeah. You know, because it's, it's in a world that we live in today. You don't even have to really work that hard to outwork people. Everybody's lazy as yep. hell. Yep. They don't want to work. Yep. So if I just, you just wake up and show up. Yep. That's enough. On time. On time. <laughs> you, you're already like. Yeah. Ahead of the game. Man. Way ahead of the game. <laughs> you know, so it's like, you know, that's the, I just try to out, you know, I might not be smarter than everybody else, but yeah. I damn sure will wor- outwork them, you know, and just like show up and try to learn. But the key too is preparedness. And that's, the, it's the same issue in the military. Yeah. You get so many people who exit the military, didn't have an exit plan, and they end up living off a of disability or poor or broke or whatever the case may be. And it's like you got to have a plan. Yep. And, and you know, one thing that I did, I had a savings. So I was like, I already knew, like, I was going to save my money, um, my deployment money. And then so I have a good cushion because my wife was in residency when I got out, so she wasn't making any money. Had my post 9-11 GI Bill. I was going to stay in, you know, stay in grad school. So now I'm in grad school because with the post 9-11 GI Bill, you get paid literally a salary to go to school. That's oh, part of nice. the post 9-11 GI Bill. So I had, you know, my savings. I had my disability, and I had my, uh, I had my, uh, uh, my post 9-11 GI Bill in- income as long as I was maintaining my grades in grad school. And that was that was my plan. And my plan was, hey, once I finish school. Then I'm going to go into business consulting full time. Like I already kind of knew what I was going to do. And a lot of people don't. Yeah. And they don't have, they don't have that plan. But you got to, you got, you got to, you got to start instituting that plan. Not like when you get out. Yeah. Like years. Two years. I did it. T- I, exactly. Two, exactly. Out. Two years before yeah. I got out, I said, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I said, I want to film my hunts. Yep. And I want to do this on YouTube and I want to podcast. Yeah. I, I had, the, I had already had the wheels turning. Right. Yep. And I was, and it was, so it was like, I knew it was going to take time. Cause these guys that are having these successful shows that actually make any money, they've yeah. been doing it for 15 oh, yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I was lucky. You see the picture right here of me with that mountain lion yeah, yeah. in the first year of yeah, me doing this that on the news in the first year of me doing this, yeah. I tracked that thing down just yeah. out of pure, like, I'm not going to give up yeah, yeah, yeah. cause he was in like some of the worst terrain that I've ever even tried to yeah, climb yeah. two feet of snow and put an arrow through him with my bow. Yeah. And he was like, I mean, that was all over the news. I yeah, it was that. everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And that like catapulted me. Yeah, even more than my football career catapulted me. Yeah, and that gave me like a platform. It gave me a platform to speak to like a, a, a sense of respect amongst like the, in uh, this in this hunting realm with, yeah. in this community, which is like an awesome community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is such a cool community because they just like they I the amount of hate that I was getting on the outside. Yeah, I it was. It wasn't anything compared to the love that I was getting and yeah, the support yeah. that I was getting in the in the hunting community. Yeah. And the, people come up to me all the time and they're like, "Hey, man, thank you so much for like what you're doing for yeah, our yeah. community." And you don't even realize the impact that you're having. Yeah, 
Because I do, when I speak at these events and stuff, I speak about how as hunters, we have to stay together yeah. because they're trying to take all of our hunting rights away from yep. us slowly but surely. Yep. You know, it's it's constant attack on us. Yeah. So if we don't stay together, we're gonna lose. It's yeah. like an elk herd, right? Yeah, like yeah. what does the wolf what do the wolves do to the elk herd? They yeah. separate, separate the, the weak. pack, yeah. Separate the pack and pick yeah. the week off. Yep. And that's what they do to hunters. They will like PETA and all these other yep. um all these other organizations were like coming after me. Yeah. And instead of cowering away and hiding, I found my pack in your community, yeah. In my community and gathered around them and look and leaned on them for support. And that in that support I was able to stand strong, mm. you know, regardless of the death threats I was getting. I was getting yeah. death threats to my That's family. Crazy. Sent to my house. Wow. Like, How did you find your address? I don't know. Wow. That's what you know, it's like so I was so paranoid. I was I was like I mean, I always have a, a my concealed carry on yeah. me. I have my I'm allowed to carry it yeah. like, you know, I'm doing it all legal, but I was. I noticed that I was like keeping it on me, like even more so. Yeah, like yeah, I was keeping yeah. it, you know. Instead, like normally when I have it on me, it's not loaded. Yeah, yeah. I keep bullets in it, but I don't yeah. keep one in the chamber. Yeah, I was keeping one in the chamber. Yeah, because I started feeling like people were following me, mm. and I was like, people are following me around. Yeah, and I was getting paranoid. Yeah, you know. And wife, you got a family, man. Yeah, For wife and kids. Yeah, dude. and I like didn't want my. Wife and they have your address, too. Yeah, it was creeping me yeah. out, man. And then uh, that all stopped. You know, once once it, I, I got to the point where, like, they couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. It's just like, because I was calling them out. I was yeah. on Fox News calling them yeah, out. Yeah, I was yeah. on Joe Rogan calling yeah, them out. Yeah, I was yeah. on Meat Eater podcast calling. I was on yeah. every Cam Haynes. I was yeah. on every podcast yeah. I could get on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, keep, don't, listen, yeah, yeah. do you come not mess with me. Yeah, yeah, you're going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I will. Like, I'll make you pay the man, uh, dude. You'll be paying the man, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Like you might get me, but I'm gonna get you more yeah, than you give yeah, me. I exactly, promise that. Exactly. Know? Yeah. Um, so that that's that was like that that's why it was so important for me to have something like I jumped right into it. Mm -hmm. Like it was and I was able to it was and a it's blessing. great it because it's during the fall. Yeah. Because yeah. it was like during the fall, whenever I'm like getting ready instead of getting ready for training camp, I was getting ready for elk hunting. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I was like getting myself ready to hike these mountains and yeah. carry weight and do all this stuff. And it was like such a good because I was I was I was missing the physicality yeah, yeah, and the yeah, violence yeah. of the game a little yeah. bit, you know what I mean? And the struggle and the, you know, the camaraderie, but then like, boom, you go to a hunt camp and it's yeah. like, Oh, I'm getting all yeah, that. Right it's here. all back. Like, yeah, it's right yeah, here. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? And, um, I had I initially started doing it cause I was like, this is expensive. Yeah. You need to be able to pay for this. Yeah. Make it pay for itself. Yeah. So I'm not digging into my principal. You get some you know? endorsements, man. So I did, I started yeah. getting endorsements and yeah. people started like jumping on board and now it's just growing, you yeah. know? And I'm just going to keep doing it because I love it. Yeah. You know, it's something I love to do. And it's something that you could do for the next 20, 30, 40 exactly. years. I could do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, generate an income for your family and leave something behind and not even have to tap into your your uh, NFL pot exactly. at all. You know what exactly. I mean? And that's what it's about. You know what I mean? It's about finding that thing that's that you're passionate about that, you know, uh, and building a plan towards that. Yeah. Opposed to, like, jumping out without a plan, like, as we talked about, people doing, I'm sure, in, in the NFL, but for sure in the military as well, and they end up jacked up. And I know because I get the phone calls, like, yo, I'm hurting for money. Like, dude, what? what? Go to school. Use your diploma. It's not in the GI Bill. Oh, I, I did. I screwed it up. How would you screw it up? I failed some classes, and I had to pay back. The, oh, my. It's like, come on. And then, you, and then, and then the, another issue I find with some of my people who struggle is, like, they end up taking jobs that they don't want to take. Yes. But that they have to take and they hate it and they don't excel in those jobs and they lose their job. And that was another reason why I wanted to plan because I didn't want to find myself in a position where I had to go take a job that I did not want to do. Yeah, that's my worst nightmare. Because once you get stuck in that, there's no, it's hard to come out of it. Once you get stuck in a nine to five that you have to do, it's, it's hard to get out of when that check keeps coming in every other week. And you can't take that time to invest in Something other else. stuff that you want to yeah. do, whether it's bow hunting, whether it's, you know, it's whether it's, you know, podcasting. You can't do those things that are gonna generate more wealth than this nine to five. So you're stuck. Yep. And that's why that plan is key. They get stuck in a job that you can't grow in. Exactly. You know? And that's like man, that's my honestly, that's my worst fear. Yeah. <clears throat> Was ever being stuck in a job that where I yep. just could not excel and grow and create and yep. you know I, all those things are important to me yep. you know so all right so so you get out of you get out you leave you you retire from the seals right i didn't retire i, I just separated you just separated yeah so i honorably i was just like you know what i'm gonna get out 
um, and got, was in grad school. Right. And so roll roll right into you know I was already in grad school when I was in. So just roll right into you know finishing that up, and I was going to go into business consulting full time. And uh, that was the plan. I had some business consulting jobs. My brother-in-law, he's a YPO. You ever hear of YPO? Young yeah. President's Organization. So he's part of, he's, he's out of the Toronto chapter. And so he was getting me, you know, consulting gigs with, you know, his fellow YPO, you know, comrades. And, uh, and so I was doing that while going to school and then doing speaking engagements as well. And then, you know, May of 2016 is when uh, I got hit up to work on Transformers. And which brings me to another point that I try to tell veterans, and I'm sure it applies to to pro athletes as well. You know, I don't know if you ever heard of a guy by the, by the name of Nate Boyer. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so Nate, he did like a uh, film called MVP. I think it was called MVP or something like that. But where it's like this NFL former NFL player and this veteran kind of come together, and and uh, it's a pretty cool story. But they come together and and share the similarities between their transition, you know, because NFL players having a hard time transitioning yeah. out, of, out of, you know, he, he's out, not making the money anymore. And then the uh, NFL player, the, the veteran is like struggling with PTSD. So they kind of, it was, it's a pretty cool story, but I say all that to say, um, I, uh, I, uh, th- another key lesson I learned was being open to opportunities that you do not want to have anything to do with. Yeah, and so like I I was I didn't want to have anything to do with the film and TV business, like I was just trying to do my business thing, and then I got contacted to work on Transformers. What kind of work? Uh, like consulting and then like acting, you know. Nice. So it was, it was dual, and that was Transformers the last night, and uh, and so I was like, sure, I'm not I'm not doing anything. I'm just writing papers for school. I got some time. I don't have any uh, consulting gigs I got to do. Let me go do it, and. Uh, that's when I really learn more about st- the power of storytelling. And, 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 and when I say it, I mean its ability to impact masses, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas like when I was writing in the teams, it was like, it's just impacting a mission or operation, right? In Hollywood, it's like one film, one TV show can impact millions of people. Millions. Millions of people. Billions, honestly. Billions, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I just worked on that. One day turned into three weeks, three weeks turned into six months on Transformers, and I started getting more consulting gigs um, and slash acting gigs as well. Then Michael Bay hired me to work on Six on the Ground, I want to say in 2018. And uh, that I was just a consultant on that one for the most part. And that was when I was like, dude, like, I want to learn, I want to learn screenwriting, you know, um, because I was already doing well as a, Still doing well as a business consultant, doing well as a film TV consultant. But I, the, the thing is, like, as a consultant on a film and TV show, you get paid pretty good, but you're giving away all of this knowledge yeah. to a writer that's getting, and a director that's getting paid millions of dollars. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, you know, you'll get $6,000 a week, $7,000 a week, which is good money. That's really good, yeah. But this guy's getting like a million dollars a week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know what I mean? And so that's when I was like, dude, I'm going to teach myself screenwriting. And yeah, I had this storytelling muscle cause I had already written my memoir at that point, but screenwriting is all about formatting. You know, it's being, being able to tell a, a, a big story, but in a, in a, in a short amount of time, Yeah, you know, because in the screenplay, typically you have 120 pages, one page equals a minute. That's two hours. And, uh, and so I had to learn how to take big stories and cut it down. And the best analogy that I heard for it is like what makes a license plate, uh, you know, the specialized license plate that has uh, certain words on it, what makes those cool is how somebody's able to take seven characters and deliver a cool message, right. you know, seven characters. That's what makes the cool, you know, a specialized license plate. And that's the way it is with a screenplay. And so once I learned my learned uh, uh, formatting. I wrote my first screenplay, which was actually Chameleon. And uh, uh, and then I wrote another screenplay called The Last Shall Be First, true story about the first group of African-Americans to serve in special operations. And that screenplay got me, got in front of uh, Revelations Entertainment, Morgan Freeman's production company. Oh, nice. And uh, they we were going to do it, but then just didn't work out the deal, just didn't work out deal wise, points wise, like, yeah. you know, it, nothing bad on their part, nothing bad on my part, just didn't work out. Yeah, it just couldn't come together. And uh, and then I wrote it, and then those two scripts, Chameleon and Last Shall Be First, got me 
hired to adapt the book into a limited series, which got me into the WGA, which is the Writers Guild of America. And then um, Chameleon got picked up by a major production company. I went through a year of rewrites on that screenplay. And this is when I, it was after that where I was like, you know what, I need to learn directing because after I finished the, 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 um, the rewrites on the screenplay, that producer sent the screenplay to different directors to try to get them attached because that's the only way a film can move forward. Like I said, it's almost impossible for a film to get made and uh, kept on getting the same note. Love the script, great story but I'm booked up for the next two years. I'm booked up for the next three years. I'm booked up for the next five years. And I'm just like, dang, dude, I put all of this work into this script mm. and now I can't get a director. And then I was like, why do I keep, do I need to keep chasing these directors? Why don't I just teach myself directing? And so um, it was around that time that I taught myself direct. I started to teach the process of teaching myself directing and learning from being on set with Michael Bay and pulling stuff from consulting. As I consulted on other film and TV projects, I would make sure that, okay, this is not just going to be a consulting gig or an acting gig. This is going to be my film school. So yeah. I became more intentional about that. So you're paying attention to the best. Exactly. Watching how the best do it. Exactly. Exactly. Part of that plan, you know, okay, okay. now if I'm pivoting, if I'm still doing a business consulting thing, which was my plan, and that's kind of working out, and now I want to pivot into this, this next realm of, uh, of my life, then I need to plan. I can't just jump in and be like, I'm going to be a director now. So it was all part of a process. Yeah. And uh, uh, at the same time, somebody read the script that I had done a, did a rewrite on and they were like, yo, this can be an awesome book series. And, and, and that, and pretty much that script got in the hands of a few publishers and the publishers read it and was like, yeah, this will be an awesome book series. And then I got the book deal for chameleon. And so, um, but and how same, long, when did that, when did that book come out? Uh, the book, this book came out July 25th. So a couple weeks ago. And is it a bestseller yet? Uh, it's a bestseller on Amazon in some categories. It hasn't. Well, hit I know the that New there's politics yeah, involved yeah, yeah. with the New York Times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, it hasn't hit the New York Times, but but on Amazon in a bunch of different categories, it's hit like number well, show, one. Show them the book, man. Yeah, it's, I don't know what the camera was. It? Right here. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's the book Chameleon, a black box thriller. It's uh, uh, I tell people all the time that it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, fictional extension of my memoir Transform because Kali can't delete characters from Nigeria just like I'm from Nigeria yeah. came to New York City um, you know worked in in, in, in a government program uh, this program is a CIA program called Black Box and uh, and yeah he's uh, part of this cool team that's looking to stop an international worldwide tragedy I didn't want to go with the the the, ant, the lead antagonist in it is a uh, um, he doesn't have a nuclear bomb or chemical or biological weapon that he's going to release upon the world. I wanted to go in a different direction. And so I went in the direction of economic warfare um, because it's real. Yeah. And uh, uh, a lot of people are not you know, aware of it, but it plays a huge role in destabilizing uh, economies and destabilizing countries. Yeah, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and and so that's what the the main antagonist is doing. He's figured out a way to manipulate the worldwide stock market and and uh, through hostage taking and through some other means, and and he's making millions of dollars. But the ultimate goal is to destabilize a Western economy. So that's what our group is trying to do. And so we follow this team. That what that's what they're trying to stop. So we follow Kali and his team as they're. They're, they're digging and, and investigating, trying to find out the identity of this guy, but also you know, investigating how he's, he's manipulating the worldwide stock market and causing these, this uh, economic destabilization in some parts of the world. Is this in audio too? Yep, I did the audio It's your audio, right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. you. Yep. I okay, did. I'm going to listen to the audio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did the you're audio sitting here telling me a story, I'm like, keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I did the audiobook read for uh, Transform too, but the cool thing is, I also. Oh, you did the Transformer audio. Yeah, yeah, I did the Transform audiobook oh, as well nice. in my memoir. And so the cool thing is, um, I'm doing. A, I got a film that I'm releasing this uh, this Tuesday, and I took two chapters and I adapted those two chapters into a limited series. I'm sorry, into a short film. Nice. And so uh, I'll be you directed that. that I directed it, wrote it, directed and it. Do you love doing the directing? Oh, I love it, man. I, mean, I feel like it's probably uh, right up your alley. Oh man, I love I think it, dude. It's perfect for you. Yeah, it's like I, I, uh, I, it's, it's, it's like kind of like you find found your community in hunting, mm -hmm. and it closely resembles what you did in in in, in the NFL. Like that's how it is for filmmaking. Like it's like you got your director who's like the oh I see the platoon. It's like being in a SEAL team again. Yeah, you know what I mean. And it's and it's and it's fast, and you got to move fast, and you got to make quick decisions and 
a lot's a lot's on the line, you know, financially, mm-hmm. and it's storytelling at its at at its peak. And I just love storytelling, and so um, I love directing more than anything. Man, it's so awesome. Yeah, you got to put me in one of these movies. Bro. I will. Dude, I was so funny. I was thinking about that early when I was looking at the beard, and, and I was like, dude, I got to figure out a, a, a role to would, throw you in. People man. always tell. So like the WWE was recruiting me a little bit, and I was oh, yeah? like, man, I was like, I beat my body up enough. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm talking to like guys that are in it and still, and they're like, man, I'm, I feel like shit yeah. every day. And I'm like, yeah, I don't really want to have to do that anymore. Yeah. Like, I want to move on to something, something different. Yeah. Uh, and acting is something that I think I'd be really good at. Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I, I was thinking about we that. We talked earlier, about doing yeah. some stand up. Yeah. You know, um, a couple of my buddies are stand up comedians, and okay. they're like, dude, you'd be great at this. Yeah, like, yeah, you're good yeah. at telling a story. You're yeah. good at like being animated and uh, getting in and out of character and stuff like that. Like, yeah. it's, it's easy for me to do that. Yeah. Because it is like, you know, that the reason why I, what really f- like drew me to you right away was the name of the book was Chameleon. Yeah. Because I was like, man, I always felt like I was a chameleon my yeah. whole life because I always had to like transform myself into whatever yeah. environment I was in. Yeah. You know, so it was like, whether I was, you know, as a defense lineman, like that girl, like living in the inner city for a little bit, then living in the country. Like I always had to kind of conform to yeah. whatever it was that I was, I was surrounded by. So yeah. you just kind of like mold yourself into that. Yeah. And, move on to the next one, mold yourself into that, yep. and make yourself fit in. Yep. And that was, uh, you know, that's really the way I had lived yeah. my whole life, you know? And then it wasn't until recently where I figured out like who I am exactly yeah. and who I want to be Yeah, because I spent so much time like conforming yep. and transforming myself into yeah. something that I thought people would like and yeah. to get that attention, you know? Yeah. So it's really just such a, dude, it's such a cool thing. And I would uh, love, if there's something that you think that I would like, and I'm not... I don't want to pitch myself on, on the podcast, but yeah. it's like, dude, if there's something that you want me to like, I'll just come. I'm not asking for anything. Let me just try. No, out. no, I, you dude, know what I mean? I'm going to tell you, dude, when we were talking or when you were talking, I can't remember what we were talking about earlier, but I, like, I was looking, I was like, cause you, 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 you look like a team guy. You look like a soft operator. You look like a former like GRS type guy. Like yeah. you got the build, you got the beard, you got the, you got the hair, you got it all. And so I was like, man, you should think about doing something in the film, but I'm 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 sure I'll be able to find something to put you yeah, in. Dude, just sure. let me know, man. Yeah, I'll yeah. do. I'll even if it's just a tryout. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just all I need is an opportunity. I will do it more than a tryout. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think I'd be good at it. Yeah. I do. I like that's something that like, yeah. I that's one of those things where I always thought that like I think I'd be a good actor. I think yeah. I'd be good at like, you know, I think it would be fun yeah. more than anything. You know, I know it's hard work. And you got you, know? you ain't got to worry about doing those stunts because we'll yeah. get a stunt double for you. I mean, that's the problem though. I'm gonna want to do them. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. Hey, like, be oh, we're, we're getting tossed off of what building? Yeah, uh, let me try it, you know? Dude, that's an art in and of well, itself. Well, here, bro. you'll like this. So um, another SEAL guy, a yeah. friend of mine, I'm not going to say his name because yeah. we're trying to get this thing to in the, we're trying to make this hunt happen. Yeah. They want me to jump out of a plane at 17,000 feet uh, into a landlocked area. They got tandem you or you going to, you got to get your skydive They're going to tandem me. Okay. Um, because he said that you have to jump with oxygen at that height. Yeah, yeah. And then we're going to jump into this landlocked area, hunt an elk with our bow, and then get heloed out. Oh, that'd be fun. And I just was like, dude, this is like so intense and yeah. out of control that I, it's perfect for yeah, me. It's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Like, yeah. let's do it. You know, so he's like, he's been working on trying to get all of the permitting and everything because we have to have like a full safety, medical staff yeah, and yeah, all the safety yeah, stuff yeah, and yeah. all the waivers. Yeah, and, DZO commander. Yeah, yeah, it has to be yeah. like, and because we're using SEALs yeah, yeah. to jump. You know, yeah. the only person, the only people that will jump out of a plane with me are SEALs yeah. because everybody else is too small. Yeah. He's like, we can get a shoot that's big enough for oh, yeah, us. Don't worry. Like, yeah. we have them. And oh, I was yeah. like, because everybody else that I've tried to jump out of a plane with is like, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm not jumping out of a plane with a 280 pound, nah. six foot six dude. Yeah, like, that's not happening. Doing it, yeah, yeah. He's like, your legs are going to hit first. You're going to break your leg or something. Yeah. It's going to be my fault, yeah. you know? So, so I'm just, uh, I'm, and that's what I'm saying. Like when you talk about being open to something that like yeah, an opportunity that you never thought would be something you would be interested yeah. in. It's the, it's the same thing with like the stand up. My buddy was like, dude, we should do a show. Yeah, yeah. And like comedy works has already said that they'll like, they'll let us do it. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I was like, Holy shit! This is yeah. actually maybe going to yeah, happen. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I was, it was and, never, it might, and it might be scary, and you might screw up in the beginning. But I'm at the end of the day, suck at first. But right? at the end of the day, it's you, you know, it's it's a it's a process, and it's being open, and you never know what that'll lead to. You never know, man. You know like what I'm you never know, and that's what I that you know, Holly, and that was the other thing. Hollywood's something I never really thought I would yeah. do. Yeah, 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 you know what I mean. And uh, just like I never thought I'd YouTube. I never thought yeah. I'd do any of it. I never thought I'd be like 
making sure my engagement was up on my yeah, social media yeah, and stuff yeah. like, cause when I was playing, I was like, I don't care about yeah, this stuff, yeah, yeah. you know? And yeah. my wife's like, you need to like keep up with this thing. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, like yeah. you can capitalize it's a business. on this. It's a business. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, and now I'm grateful that she like did that for me. And, yeah. You know, and my, like the look that you see is this is who I am. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I am who I am. Like the dreads people be like, Oh, you're culturally appropriating. And I'm like, Dude, I'm like, I come from Viking ancestors. Yeah, I don't man. take like, it. That's that. what. Yeah. Like normally, it's bra- it's braided in the back yeah, yeah, and stuff. Yeah. I take it out when I'm on a hunting trip, and yeah. I just got back from the back yeah, yeah. back country. So like, you can't keep it in a braid. Yeah, yeah. You know, you just can't. You'll get bugs and stuff. Yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah. I got to be able to clean the bugs yeah, out of my yeah, hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Beehive, so, dude. Yeah, you might. You know, you're, you're tromping through like some of the nastiest stuff out there. Yeah. So like. You know, my hair and my beard and like my tattoos and everything, they're all like Viking based yeah, tattoos, yeah, like yeah. Odin and yeah, yeah, yeah. Odin's wolves and Odin's raven and like all these things that resonate with me. And yeah, because I didn't have that, like, I didn't know where I came from. Yeah, so once yeah. I did my DNA test and yeah, figured yeah. out that I come from Viking ancestors, yeah, yeah. I was able to tap into that. And yeah. I was like, oh, like, everything makes perfect. sense. That's why I'm big. That's why I'm six That's foot why seven. I'm big. That's why I'm so aggressive. That's yeah, why yeah. I'm so like dry. Just keeps going yeah, forward. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. never say die. Yeah. You know, that's savage. Yeah. You know, it's like that savage yeah. is in my blood, you know? And you know, that's why dude, this would be so cool to do. Like I was, it, it, it's funny. Cause you said it, I always envisioned myself as like, doing a military yeah, yeah, yeah. show. Like, that's, that's how I saw you. That's how I saw you. I, I, you know, I, like, I was, I was thinking, I was like, dang, it would have been cool to get you in the short film. Cause we have like uh, we have like operator guys playing operators in the short from you would have been perfect for it. But now I know though. Yeah, the well, next and one for other stuff. Yeah, the for next the actual one, dude, feature. And I'm ready. Yeah, Let yeah, me know. Yeah, absolutely. Let me know, bro. That yeah. would be so dope. Yeah. But I appreciate you coming on, man. No, thank and you. Telling for your me story. On. Yeah. And uh, we could go for another two hours, yeah, just, yeah. you know, just bullshit. And so I don't even know. it feels like we only been going for like thirty minutes. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Time flies. Yeah. <laughs> How long have we been going? Yes, yeah, this yeah. is the longest one I've ever done. Oh, wow. Well, uh, and that just shows you flies, like, the yeah. chemistry. Yeah. You know, I, and I really do. I appreciate your time. No, I know uh, you're busy, you know, flying out here to Denver for me. You know, I just so appreciative and grateful uh, for that. Man. Thanks for having me out, man. Yeah, thanks man. For, Thank having you me for the, the book, too. Can you sign, sign that thing man. for me? I got signing right now, man. I think you're going to crush this directing game. That, Thank and you, that's man. the other thing. I would love to have you direct me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I feel like some of these guys, so I, di- I did a little bit of sports radio yeah. and these guys were just not like me. You know what I mean? They didn't think like me. So they didn't really know how to coach me. And so I felt like I was kind of in it by myself and I had to learn on my own. Yeah. And I ended up doing pretty well at it, but it just was like, it was one of those jobs where I didn't feel like I could climb. You know what I mean? It wasn't, yeah. I didn't love it enough. You know, it wasn't something I was passionate about. Thank you, bro. Not a problem. I appreciate you. Bro. Well, yeah, well, we're gonna make something happen for sure. Mark my words, man. It's over. It's already recorded on the podcast too. So, oh yeah, it's already out there. My, in the mark universe. my words, like I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put you in something, man. Bro, please. Yeah, that'd yeah, be so dope. yeah, bro. Thank you, bro. Appreciate you, I appreciate you, man. God bless.